You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Pablo Escobar came in. She introduced us. He had shook hands. Took me. He said the same thing. We've got all you can do, all the work you can do. $5,000 a kilo. Be glad to have you on board. He went on back to his office. So he was in a plaid shirt. Guy about my size, five foot eight, 160 pounds. So he seemed nice enough. He didn't didn't have fangs or horns at that time. So I was making fifty thousand, fifty five thousand dollars a trip after my expenses. But it was just so simple. We started harvesting. We had a billion dollar crop. They charged me with what they call a continuing criminal enterprise. That uh, I was number forty one in the United States. It's called an eight forty eight Title twenty one eight forty eight continuing criminal enterprise. It can carry up to life without parole. And John Gotti, I was number 41 in the United States to be charged with it. And John Gotti was number 42. I paid millions and give up my property and made a deal. And I got 35 years for the marijuana, 30 years for the marijuana, and five years for the income tax evasion. They took me and they, they had little chains and on your handcuffs and they pull you apart like this and on your feet. And they spread me over a barrel, buttered my backside up. And I thought, uh-oh. And they came with hot chili pepper and poked my whole colon full of hot chili pepper. And it burnt the lining off of my intestines. I got arrested in Spain, escaped. I got arrested in Holland, I escaped. And then finally they caught me again in Spain. I jumped out the window, 31 feet from the window bottom to the top of a car, exploded in the street. Did you not have the check of $15 million in your pocket, but you had to eat it? I ate, I went into the bathroom and ate the receipt. I had it in my pocket. I didn't want them to find that. I had a uh-huh. receipt for $15 million, yes. Well, I went down to see old Chor, see about $3.5 million. And I saw my friend that wanted to introduce me to him. And uh, of course, I wasn't going to get my money from him. He said, well, listen, would you like a job? We'll get you, pay you $20 million to uh, to buy a boat and uh, take it to Australia, take a, take a little bit off to Australia. Sure, I'll do it. That's a lot of money and for three months of work. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got one of the most famous drug smugglers of all time, Roger Reeves. How are you, Roger? I'm mighty fine. Pleased, pleased to be here with you. Yeah, it's an honour to be have you hear that phenomenal story. It's, it's a mad story as well. Sad, happy. It's a mixture of so many different things. You've spent over thirty years in prison, Roger, but you've worked with some of the biggest drug dealers known to mankind. Like you've worked with Pablo Escobar. You've been friends with uh, Barry Seal, who was murdered by Escobar, but. Mad story. You just got out of prison two years ago after serving a life sentence in Australia for drug smuggling, the biggest drugs bust of all time with nearly a thousand kilos of cocaine. First and foremost, Roger, how are you? I am fine. Just fine. Yeah, I'm healthy. I'm blessed. Blessed every day. That's what I, I think you saw where I just just did a hundred push ups without stopping just this moment. Yeah, and at the age of seventy nine, is that correct? Almost eighty in a couple more months. Yeah, good on you, mate. I'm proud uh, of myself. Yes, I am. <laughs> back my help. I always go back to the start with my guest, Roger, just to get a bit of understanding about yourself, where you grew up, and how it all began. All right. I was born down in St. Augustine, Florida, during the war. Uh, my dad uh, was a foreman of a, a veneer plant, and my mother worked there. They made the boxes for the shells to ship to the soldiers in, in the war. When the war was over, uh, my great grandpa had died, and uh, we inherited a farm and a three mule farm. So we moved up to the farm, and I was raised there with my mother, my daddy, a grandma, <clears throat> and I slept in a big feather bed with my grandma until she died. And uh, then my dad died when I was 17 years old. He was an alcoholic, so we were poor on a nice farm. And uh, he died, and my mother, boy, she she worked like crazy, and she paid the debt off, and. Uh, I stayed there with her for about 25, 26 years. I farmed with my mother. And uh, I uh, would go to Canada in the summertime and work for six weeks 
They was uh, like the grapes of wrath. We made three dollars a day, maybe four or five if we were lucky, working all day long in the heat, in Georgia, picking tobacco, picking cotton, whatever. But they was offering twenty dollars a day room and board in Canada. So I started hitching hike up there in the summertime, and I would make six or seven hundred dollars in six weeks. <laughs> and uh, so uh, let's see, I, when I was about eighteen or nineteen years old, I met my wife, and that was uh, quite a story. Uh, um, and so it's been 60 over 60 years ago that we met that's a long time it's changed days now roger people can't even last over 60 minutes now like what were you what were you like was there much school back in the 40s and 50s roger did you were you at much school at school yeah i went yeah. on through high school and then I, I went off to agricultural college but i didn't do well i didn't have to study i didn't study in school but i went off to college and it was a different <laughs> it was a different story so uh, I uh, after I met Mari, uh, shall I tell you about that meeting her? That of was course, a, that was a colorful thing. Uh, uh, that that was backbreaking work called sand lug. You had to get it. And that was a big farm, hundred acres, and then big mules, big big draft horses. And every time I'd put my foot up, he'd put his foot down, and uh, breathing on my back all day long in that heat up in Canada. But when the leaves got up about a foot off the ground, we could go fast. So about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, we were finished. We'd made our $20. And then sometimes we'd sucker. We'd break the suckers behind the leaves, and I'd make another $10. So boy, I was racking up money. And I'd come in and the greenhouse had a, a, some water that was heated up, and I'd take a shower and get that stink off of me. But that bunkhouse was full of men from all over the world. It was like Tower of Babel in there. And uh, they, that place stunk. But anyway, some of the boys from a neighbor farm came over in old 1949 Ford said, Roger, you want to go to the carnival tonight? Let's go. So we loaded up, went to Tilsonburg, Ontario. And when we came through the gate, what a place it was. It was huge. And the first place we went in was a Hoochie Coochie show. I think we paid a dollar to get in. <laughs> I'd never <laughs> seen anything like that before. <laughs> Certainly not in the Bible Belt down in Georgia. You want to see that. It wasn't anything not even bad in today's world, but it was it was risque at that time. And then we went on down the road a walk, walkway of ways, and we came to a great big man. I guess he's three or 400 pounds, had a flowing beard down his chest, and he had a bear in a, in a circus cage there, and he was walking the platform with a microphone, five brand-new $100 bills. Anybody wrestle my bear and get all four feet off the ground? Anybody, come on, $10, anybody give it a try. Come on, you yellow-bellied Canadians ain't got guts enough to wrestle my bear. <laughs> What's your name, young man? Roger Reeves. How much you weigh, Roger? I weigh 145 pounds. 145-pound man against 600-pound beast. And he opened that little cage and threw me in, and the people were just flocking him when they saw a fool come up. <laughs> they knew what was going to happen. <laughs> That old bear got up, and he wasn't little like he looked like. He was big as a mule when he got up. And uh, I slammed into him, and the cage was all loose and flimsy, so it made a lot of noise. And uh, anyway, he hit me about my knees and left me just level out there. And I hit the ground and wham, blam, and trying to shook my head in the crowd. Yeah, he sick him, Roger. Well, he did that two or three times, and I thought, well, man, I got to get a better – to, uh, uh, something better here so I grabbed the top of that cage and I could kick that bear with both of my feet I kicked him right in the head I thought I was supposed to be fighting that bear that was the guy's pet <laughs> that bear came insane he just went I mean he threw me in the corner so hard till I thought my breath was never going to come out of me and he just padded and tore the clothes off of me <laughs> and the man went in and snapped the chain on him and uh, Oh, I pulled him off and he ran over the man. This chain got snapped and the part of the tent fell down. And I was yell, yeah, see, sick of me. I asked him <laughs> my $10. He, he told me to go to hell. <laughs> well, they, they took me back to the bunkhouse that night. And I got out of the car and fell down. I couldn't walk. I'd been traumatized like I'd been in a wreck. So I couldn't work for two days. And the boys come on Sunday and said, let's go down to Turkey Point. And, uh, so I went and I limped out on the pier with my clothes on. I didn't feel like bathing suit. And uh, the three girls was out on the pier on a, on a towel. And one of them was Mari, my wife. And that was over 60 years ago. Congratulations, 60 years of love. And it's not been an easy, 
Yeah. On you go, brother. So she should she should have known I was a transient farm worker wrestling a bear in a carnival. What could have yeah. told her better? Yeah, that was us that was our sign to stay away, Roger. But thankfully you are still with each other and obviously we'll get into the nitty gritty where it's not been easy in love for like a woman to have stuck by you after spending over 30 years in prison. Don't get me wrong, there must have been some good times, but obviously with good times comes the bad times as well. But when you were younger, Roger, did your grandfather not do a murder? Did he not kill someone in court? Yeah, it was rather a, a publicized uh, trial. He was a school teacher, and I understand he was a small man. And, uh, and back that time, I guess guys went on to school. Only, they'd only work or go to school one or two months a year learn to read and write and so someone was in there over 20 years old well there was one fellow in there i guess he'd uh had some trouble with him he just bring in a load of stove wood he took a piece of they, they heated their stove in this little rooms and he had that guy upside the head with a piece of stove wood and so they took him to court to fire him and my grandpa got up to tell his side of the story and they said he was a very principled really really good person and uh he must have been having trouble with that fellow so uh, uh, the man told his side of the story and sat down and my grandpa stood up to tell his side. And when he started, the man named Woods jumped up and pointed his finger at him and said, you're a goddamn liar. And my grandpa pulled a pistol out, shot him twice right through the heart. <laughs> and the bullets went into the door of the courtroom. You can still see them about four inches apart where they dug them out. And he walked up and laid the gun on the judge's desk. I still got the old pistol, a Webley 38 breakdown from World War I, of those type they used. And the judge said, Reeves, I believe you have killed him. He said, I hope the hell he's dead. So <laughs> I don't know if it runs in the family or not, but that was, that was a heck of a story that was told there. <laughs> How was, like, for that as a kid, like, was that something so out of the ordinary or was that something you were quite used to? Oh, I've never heard of such a thing before or since. That was just unusual. He went, uh, they gave him, uh, I believe, 15 years in regional penitentiary, and he went in and was a um, bookkeeper. They said that he uh, was a really smart man, that uh, trains come by and the numbers on the boxcar, he could add them all up as fast as the train would go by. So, but after three years, he went blind with cataracts and they operated on him and blinded him. And the, and the governor pardoned him and he taught school the rest of his life um, for many more years. As a blind man. So what did they do? Made them blind? Well, they took the cataracts off and they in the operation. That was the very beginning of it. And, and they bl he went blind from the operation. I don't know what happened. It was in a prison operation. Certainly it wasn't. Uh, they, they didn't use disinfectants. And, and they were still just bloody hands and bloody sheets and all that stuff back in the early 1900s. Yeah. So, so it could have probably been... got infected. Yeah, yeah something sad. happened. He went blind. So, what was your first job, Roger? Before um, all well, the went, smuggling I went to work. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I went to work in a grocery store when I was fourteen years old, and I paid the lunch money for my little brothers and sisters. And uh, see, I started off three dollars a day, and we were fourteen hours. And uh, then the next year, it went up to four dollars a day, and another child started to school. So I never had twenty-five cents left over for all those years. And then I worked in the logging woods a little bit in the summer and then go up to Canada and picked out tobacco. And that, that's about all I ever did, just worked on the farm. There was plenty of there. They were never over. Mm -hmm. So see that back... Th yeah, so see back then, Roger, like when you're working, you're on a farm, you're hardworking, you're in nature, was there no involvement in crime or trying to cut corners at a young age? No, never heard of it. I, not, nobody I knew broke the law. Nothing. We just... I had a little horse I rode, and my buddy had a bicycle, and on the uphills, I'd throw him a rope and pull him up the hills, and we'd race and go 20, 30 miles sometimes. We do. I was just, I had a wonderful young life. Look, Christian family, they, my grandma prayed us to sleep every night on our knees. We're just good people. There was nothing to do with uh, outlaw stuff except my grandpa, but way before I was born, killed somebody. Mm -hmm. What did you do after the farm, Roger? <clears throat> Let's see, I got a job on the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, and I was a fireman on the diesel electric, and they called a feather bed. We didn't have anything to do because the other firemen had used to shovel coal and throw wood into fire, 
And those old engineers were mad. They were jealous of us. Look at the knots in my legs where I shovel coal for 20 years before I got your place. But anyway, it paid the same price as an engineer that had been there 40 years. They just, the unions on the railroad was good. But anyway, my, uh, I got married and moved to the farm. Up in, I got married in Canada and took Mari down to the farm. Oh, what a eye opener it was for her with the rattlesnakes and all the woods and the, the farming. And, uh, it, it was just the, the animals. <clears throat> but she just loved it. She just sparkled with it. So everything was new. So uh, my mother, I think I told you my daddy died when I was 17 years old. My baby sister was only six weeks old. So my mother and I borrowed the money to put in chickens. So we put in 36,000 laying hens and mortgage, mortgage the farm. Well, it wasn't long before there was 20 million chickens within 20 miles either way of my house. The arena company had come in and they just had said, all right, let's make this uh, the center for egg producing in America, I reckon. <clears throat> so price of eggs kept going down and the price of feed kept going up. And every time we pick up 12 eggs, we lost a nickel. So it don't take too long, too many years of that. And we owed $78,000 and the bank's going to foreclose on the place. So I started taking some of that chicken feed and making whiskey. I went and got me some vats, 8,000 gallons a piece and made a condenser. And I learned how to make whiskey. And I was making 1,000 gallons a week, selling at $3.50 a gallon. So that's a lot of money. And it didn't take, take nothing much to, to make it. So uh, the whiskey still blew up. And, uh, I had outrun the bloodhounds and swim across an icy creek and I got away. But anyway, there was, was so much trouble until the railroad fired me. They didn't want me anymore. You have something on your record like making whiskey, no matter whether you're guilty or not. And the long chain man come, took the trucks and the tractors. I was paralyzed, broke. So uh, I, uh, I left the farm and went out to California. My sister lived out in Torrance, California. And uh, my wife and I, and I had a little girl, two years old. And we went out there and I went to work framing and shoveling concrete and then I got a job as electrician I told them I was an electrician I was a counterfeit electrician they never found out <laughs> so uh, they uh, you had a right to work if you lived in another state that didn't have unions so that I signed the right to work and I, the other guy I didn't know which wires to put on and I'd say you hook them and I'll pull them what all right well that was the easy part so <laughs> and uh, so then I took a test for the Redondo Beach Fire Department in California that was a good paying job and I got it. There's 400 people applied for that job. So I was really, really fortunate to get that job. So I went on the fire department there in, in uh, Redondo Beach, and I rode rescue and bumpers. And then for the last couple of years, I, I drove the back of a hook and ladder truck, 108 footer. That was something else. That was that was a rig. So uh, with that, I uh, you only work nine or ten days a month on the fire department because you work 24 hours a day. Are you there? And I, I had a I had a business. I did little room additions and had a painting crew. Then I started hauling antiques out of a Missouri back uh, back during the gold rush time, or the, when people were coming to California and Oregon, they would leave New York or Atlanta, where they lived in the East Coast, and they would come to uh, Missouri on the train. Then they would get up, take a ferry across the uh, across the river with all their goods. And they found out that those wagons just were not big enough to haul what all they brought. So they left their big pieces, I mean, by the millions along that river on, on the west side where they couldn't get them. Those wagons were called Studebakers. And we have the Studebaker car. Was, went to those people that were making that wagon went to making the car later on. But anyway, I would go back there and I had a couple of firemen. <clears throat> they would just have, <clears throat> have a barn full of furniture and, and antiques. And I'd go over there with a big semi and take it back to California and have an auction. Well, man, I was making good money. So I bought me an airplane, sold that, and bought another one. I'd already learned to fly. And I'll back up a little bit. I read a book when I was a boy called Jungle Pilot, the story of Nate Saint. And he started Missionary Aviation Fellowship. And that was where the missionary, where these pilots would go, and they would take the mail and medicine to the um, missionaries I say in Borneo where they had to walk two weeks to get to get out well he would take it in his little Piper cub and put put a line down and like a, a rodeo guy curls it and he'd put the little box right at the missionary's feet and they'd 
get their mail and put their mail in and say, I need penicillin. He'd wind it up and put what they needed back in. And he started Missionary Aviation Fellowship. And I thought, wow, I would love to fly for that outfit. So I tell that story because it, it comes around. But anyway, uh, life went on and I didn't, I, I didn't do that job. They wanted me to go to school three years to be an airplane mechanic so I could work on my own planes in Borneo or South America. But uh, I bought a Cessna 182 and Mari and I and little girl would fly down to Mexico and uh, we'd catch a good bunch of fish in the ice chest. I'd bring them back. And a time or two, I didn't even stop for the border. There was nobody there. If you, if you stopped, you had to wait all day to get somebody to come out to clear customs. So one fellow says, why don't you bring some marijuana back? And I thought, I don't know nothing about it. I heard the kids smoke it, but I just, I don't know anything about it. He said, man, it's the hottest thing since pancakes. <laughs> so, and I said, well, what, what, what they pay? He said, I don't know. I'll introduce you to somebody. So he introduced me to a fellow, and this guy said, you got an airplane? You might fly some airplane? I said, yeah, according to how much you pay, what's the deal? He said, I'll pay you $10,000. So I said, well, throw some of that hay in there. <laughs> so I did a little of <laughs> And came across, there was nothing to it. I mean, just absolutely nothing. And he gave me $10,000 in a bag. I, I didn't need the money. I just, it was just kind of like a, a windfall. That was almost two years' pay on the fire department at that time. Take home. So I, I dumped it on the bed, and my wife put her hand over her mouth and said, oh, my goodness, you know, that's a lot of money. And the baby grabbed some $100 bills and crawled in the round, and we just laughed. And we went to a lockbox and put it in the lockbox. We didn't need it. We went out to dinner. I said, don't look at the right-hand side. Just look at the left. They get anything. So uh, I went to a lawyer, and I put a hundred, gave him $100. I said, got about a two-minute question, Mr. Lawyer. You a criminal lawyer. If I got caught bringing pot back from Mexico, what would happen to me? And he said, what's your criminal history? <clears throat> I said, I don't have one. I've, I've never been arrested for anything. And he said, I've never had a, a, a speeding ticket. I've never even had a parking ticket. He said, you work on the fire department? I said, yes, sir. He said, for sure you'll get probation. But just in case you didn't, then uh, you'd get one year and spend four months raking leaves on a military base. I thought, well, that ain't a bad deal. <laughs> so I went and bought me a bigger airplane. I bought a Cessna 207. That's the biggest thing they had back then. And I'd go down there and I'd get $40,000. Now, I didn't buy it or sell it. I just put it for this other fellow. I'd dump it out on the dry lake. His man pick it up. And a week or two later, they'd give me the $40,000 and I'd go back. So I bought me a new Cadillac like an idiot. <laughs> so my mama came out, my baby sister, and I took them to Disneyland. And my mom and I was always close. She's four. She said, what you doing, boy? <laughs> I said, I'm all in pot. She said, how much you making? I said, I'm making $40,000 every time I want to go down there. She said, what do they do if they catch you? And I told her what, that, what the lawyer said. And I said, what do you think, Mom? She said, do you need a co-pilot, son? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was. And I was sort of a, a, a hero in the bohemian circle. We quit going to church because I, I didn't want to be like a hypocrite and, and, and feel like one. And my wife had trouble. I had a lot of trouble with it. Well, I didn't. I mean, it was just, I thought there's nothing to that stuff. I smoked it once and it wasn't nothing to me. So I thought, wow, a little weak thing. You get a little bit of a buzz. So uh, I didn't use it anymore and never did. I didn't care for it. But to make $40,000 in a day, that was six or seven years of work. So and at that time, you could buy most any house in California, a regular house, for $30,000, $25,000, dollars need $2,500, $3,000 down. Those houses are worth a million, two dollars now. I mean, it just was just unbelievable. So uh, I um, that plane got shot all to hell and back one, one morning on the takeoff. I don't know how much of that story you want me to tell, but that was that was one of the highlights of my yeah. life. Obviously, it's it's great reward with very it's minimal risk, Roger. If you're making forty thousand dollars for a run where there's not even a chance of getting a prison sentence, anybody would have took that risk. Anybody like it's even at that time like yeah. But what was your first? What was it like doing the first drug drug run? Was it were you nervous or were you or were you calm? Because you seem a very calm character. You like you've got a great energy about you. Um, that's why you're probably still alive to this day, no doubt. But 
What was it like doing your first drug run? I was as, I, I mean, I like it. I was as, <laughs> as calm as a minnow on a mountain stream. It didn't bother me at all. Nothing. I, I was worried about landing up here in the United States. I was afraid, you know, if it, they'd be waiting on me. I remember parking my plane and jumping out and running. <laughs> when I come to just see if there's anybody behind me, I'd be like a jackrabbit. I only did that once or twice. And, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd land and the, the plane would be so loaded until I have to keep the power on all the way in to keep the tail up. And when I landed it, bang on the on the runway, a little dirt runway on the dry lake. <clears throat> so that's how much I loaded them. Yes, and uh, hundred thousand dollars. I go back to the farm. I made three hundred thousand dollars so quick. My wife said, "You don't remember like I do. You don't remember those gnats and bugs and ticks and mosquitoes and rattlesnakes." And all that hard work and <laughs> manure from the animal, she didn't want to go back. So anyhow, I I, I claim I, I, maybe I'm teasing a little bit that she kept me from going back to the farm. <clears throat> so, see when you you done your first run, what was the plans? Where did you pick it up from? Where did you take it to? How many people were involved? Uh, just two people: the <clears throat> the guy that loaded me down here and the guy that unloaded me up here up on this end. How long was the flight? all day uh i'd leave way down in mexico and then i have to come up unloaded on a dry lake or or a strip and then go into town and get fuel and then i'd drag around until it got late in the afternoon and i would fly across the border just after dark they and early in the evening is a lot of a lot of planes in the air and uh I, you don't want to fly two or three o'clock in the morning you'll be the only one up so that's that's the way i did <clears throat> And then later on, they put uh, radar all the way across the border, from all the way across the southern border uh, of Mexico. So I started going out out over the Pacific Ocean about 300 miles out and coming in behind the Santa Barbara Islands and coming up and going out in the desert land. It was a long way, and I flew low right over the water. I had uh, sometimes my windshield would be just coated with, with salt where I'd come in. And uh, that, I know that was dangerous going out that far out on an old airplane. Was it your thirteenth trip that get shot down? No, I. Uh, it was. Uh, I did two loads in that Cessna uh, one eighty two, and then I went and bought the Cessna two hundred seven, and uh, the place was. Uh, I landed was in a bend of a little river. You could call it a river, but it was maybe knee deep, and uh, you could wade across it. And uh, it was pretty there, but a lot of cactus and just poor donkeys, poor people, and poor little children. So Mari and I would go and and buy toys and candies and apples. They like the red apples. And when I would land, I would give the children these boxes of goodies. But more and more children kept coming. <laughs> the American Santa Claus is coming every week. And uh, the guy, Joaquin, a hair-left little mouse of a man, oh, he'd try to steal the candies and the stuff. <laughs> I had to kind of take I was giving him seventeen thousand dollars for the for the marijuana, and he didn't want to see those children with an apple. I I didn't like him, and uh, so it uh, there was not enough room on that runway. I think it was nine hundred feet long, and that's about what it took to take off. So I would land but right into the sun. It looked like a welding torch. It was so hot in the evening, and I'd spend the night there. And I took gasoline with me along with the goodies. And I'd fuel up, and then early the next morning, a young man that was, didn't weigh very much, uh, named Pedro, he'd get in a plane with me, and we'd fly out 20, 30 miles maybe, and uh, they would be uh, the men would have a highway blocked off. They'd block it off. They'd see the airplane. They'd come out with this truck, and they'd had the rifles all on it. Then about a mile down the road, another one would come out and block the road off. And I would land between the trucks, and then one of them would come down. They'd pass it out like a bucket brigade and fill my airplane up marijuana. And I'd shake hands with all of them in the road and then get in it and take off. Take off right over the other truck. And uh, sometime it'd be 30 cars, I guess, waiting to, to pass. It was a busy highway. And I remember one time there was a highway patrol car there. But he didn't have his light on. He was just still sitting there. <laughs> so that was that was how we did it. And uh, so one morning I walked back down to the, to the river with uh, about 10 or 12 guys. And... Uh, I got in the river and brushed my teeth. It was still dark. And just as it cracked in daylight, Pedro and I got in the plane. And I cranked the engine up. And I was I was kind of in the middle of the runway. I was going to taxi back down to the end, like I always did, and take off a full 900 feet. 
And just as I cranked it up, ow! I looked, I thought a tire blew out. That's how innocent I was. <laughs> and Pedro's bumping me, Roger, policia, policia, policia. <laughs> and it dawned on me. And I, oh boy, I don't want that. So I just pushed it to the firewall. And I think I might have might have had four or five hundred feet left in front of me. And then there was the river, and then there was a little waterfall in front of it. And just at the end of that, uh, I went tearing down that strip. I was looking at the airspeed indicator, and it would fly at about 40. And just about the time it turned 40, I pulled it up right up on its nose. And I just got riddled from both sides of the machine guns. And I was looking at the airspeed indicator, and it just disappeared. That was the first thing I noticed gone. Bam. And then all the wind, windows and the windshield was shot out. And I was I was hit three times. I didn't already know it. And then the the uh, the bullets came in from the right hand side, went up into the left wing, and ruptured the fuel tank. And that that fuel was blowing in on me like it was pouring out of a bucket, right in my face. I was just turning which way to get out of the fuel, and this, it was hanging on the propeller like this, and it felt like the rudder cables had been cut in two. So I just reached over and switched everything off. And I think I went into shock. I know I did. Just from the scare of it, I thought I was going to bust into flames any second. And so I remember coming out, probably wasn't 100 feet high, maybe 50 feet high when I pulled power and shut it down. And the rocks, the formation, uh, you know, how oh, minerals form a lot of times into geodes and all different things. Well, these look like the rock, the backs of, of turtles. As I crashed towards them, it looked, they was underwater, but they looked like it. And I hit and the wings came off. And the next time it bounced, and the next time the, the engine and all came under and came under the plane. And I'm left sitting up there, and I think I was not cuckoo at that time. And Pedro said, come on, Roger, come on. And I just stepped out now into the water. It wasn't knee deep. And here those federalis, a couple of them was coming down the, uh, down the runway, still shooting. And a couple of a couple balls hit that plane hard right, right where we were. They, they had killed us. <clears throat> so on top of the radio, I had a 9-millimeter Browning high power tape to the top of the radio just in case of crashing in the desert or whatever. I didn't have it to kill anybody. Just a little protection and stuff like that. So I just, it was right there. I just slid that thing out and I popped a few caps down that runway above their heads. And boy, they run into rocks. I didn't see them anymore. <laughs> so we took off, took off and I want to go down the mountain. And Pedro said, no, 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 they'll go that way. So we went up, up the mountain and I looked and his foot was almost shot off. They was, um, it, it, it hit the bone on the right hand side. It just blew out the ankle. It wasn't even bleeding. He was in shock. So we went on the ways and we came in. It was a lot of cactus, a lot of brush. And we was in a path and there was an old donkey. She looked like she was huge and 30 years old with us way back. Charlotte, Charlotte. And he'd give her a pet. We hopped on the back of that donkey and rode all morning till we came to a house that Pedro knew. And, uh, there was a man plowing, um, and he had a he had a little horse and a and a cow, and the horse was taller than the cow, and the yoke across their necks was all angled, and he was plowing amongst stumps, and uh, a rail fence around his place. <clears throat> and so Pedro talked to him, and he took us and put us in the house. They had nothing for our wounds, so they dropped diaper-like material. I had creased across all my head, my kneecap was shot off, and my toe was just about gone a big toe. And that thing was hurting. That toe was hurting. So I had nothing for it. So they put rags over it and, and she poured diesel oil over it to keep the flies off. So we sat there all day long and uh, about dark, oh, mules and horses just came walking fast up into the yard. They stumped in the ground. Thum, 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 thum. They, they, they use animals that can travel down there. So, uh, a man came in, Dr. Benjamin Soso. He was a Red Cross doctor from somewhere they got him. And he, uh, there was a slug up in my foot. It's still up in the, in the lodge around the ankle bone. And I think he did more damage trying to find it <laughs> than it did going in. But anyway, he was wonderful. He gave us shots of morphine and, and kept the shots and, and took care of us really well. And he, he, he was a skydiver, a world-renowned skydiver, young man. And he said, you have got to get, Pedro got to get the doctor, he'll die. And said, and they got the roadblocks, all blocks going north. They know it was an American pilot in here. And they said there was so much blood in that plane until they think you're dead. So uh, 
He said, there's roadblocks. So we got on some horses and, and rode. I don't know how far we rode, but we came to a road and there was a big truck, a big 10 wheeler, and it was loaded with corn in the, in the ear. And they dug holes in it. I guess there was 10 or 15 Mexicans all on that truck with the big sombreros and serapes. It was turning kind of cold that night. And they dug holes in that corn and put me down in it and put Pedro on the other side. And we went through three roadblocks. And that, every time the, the road was bad, and every time that truck would go from one side to the other, the corn would fall in over my face and somebody would break it back off a little bit. And uh, I guess we went an hour or so until we came to a highway. And uh, they sent the town for taxis. And I think they got Pedro out of there right away. And they sent it uh, for a taxi that would take me to Guadalajara. I think it's about an eight-hour drive south. So I went into a house, and they got me some clothes. And I remember the pan must have took 20 times to get the blood and the dirt and the filth off of me. <laughs> I was so dirty and crusted up. So a man came with a brand new taxi and he was a dwarf. And what a talker. So we headed out and they put a pillows and blankets in there. And I had these great big pain pills and I must have been not feeling no pain at all. <laughs> And so the little man talked to me all night. I said, do you have a family, senior? Oh, see, I have a beautiful family. I have a lovely wife, Dora. Let me tell you how I got my wife, Dora. You see, I'm ugly. No girl would talk to me in the village. But I had my eye on Dora. She lived across the way. And one day she's playing the flute in the back of a band. And I open the gate and I pull her in the yard. And my mother helps me pull her in the house. And she sits in a straight chair, straight up, and I tell her that I love her and we'd like to marry her. She won't even look at me, senor. And what can we do if the next morning is getting daylight? Well, we've got to do something with this girl. I don't know what to do. I'm really nervous. So we let her go home and I follow her. And she goes and she knocks on her door and her hard-hearted father screams at her, get away from here, you prostitute. You spent the night with some man. You're no daughter of mine. Get away. And Dora walked away with her head down. And Senor, I went up and said, Dora, let's go talk to the Padre. And Senor, that's how I got my beautiful wife, Dora. And one year later, we had a beautiful baby boy. And I had a new Ford. I had money, Senor. I had a Ford. And we named that boy Ford. And you won't believe it, but one year later, we had another boy. And I had a new Dodge, so we named him Dodge. And, senor, I know you won't believe it. One year later, we had another boy, and I had a new Chevrolet. And the priest, he would not he would not name him Chevrolet. And I had to teach that son of a bitch to drive to get him to name him Chevrolet. And, senor, <laughs> that's how I got my three boys. Ford Dodge and Chevrolet. Yeah. Is that a true story? <laughs> true story. That's That's right. Perfectly true. Yeah. See when your plane uh see when your plane's getting shot down, Roger, you're nearly dead, your foot's blown off. Do you think that was your sign to then call it quits? But did you ever think of not doing that again? Or was it just straight back to business once you were fit and healthy? It was back to business. I uh I I didn't know much to know. I wasn't going back to that place anymore. I knew that. <laughs> I'd had mm. enough of that. But uh, uh, two guys had been watching me land, and they were packing campers in the jungle down there. And uh, I had met them. And, and you imagine, so one of them came to see me and said, I, my boss wants to meet you. So I went and met my friend, Gerald Wills. He's the only fellow still alive out of all that. He lives down in Palace Verdes Estates. He's a wonderful person. And uh, I see him every once in a while now. And uh, he said, Roger, I'd like to buy a a big twin engine plane. And uh, if he will fly it, we're going halves. So I said, where? So he, he, uh, we went to Wisconsin and bought the plane, the twin beach that had belonged to the beach boys. What a palatial plane. That thing was wonderful. So I flew that plane on and on. I must've did 30 trips with that. That was one lucky plane. I have many stories to tell about that. How much marijuana would you take on each trip in the, in the plane, Roger? I would. I usually put a, a, about a ton, a little bit over two twenty, two hundred, twenty five hundred pounds. About a thousand kilo. Yeah, a, a thousand, twelve hundred kilos, something like that. And how much would you? How much would you? Oh, get at that, that time we were selling it. 
market. At that time, we were selling it for $60 a pound. So what's 60, 120? I don't know. I was making 50000 $55,000 a trip after my expenses. But it was just so simple. It was, sell, much, it was sell overnight. How much were they paying a kilo in Mexico? Oh, about ten, uh, eight, ten dollars. I think. Yeah, I think a seventeen dollars a pound. Yeah. Is there? How much was it going f- going for in America? One hundred, one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty a kilo. Yeah. So major profit. I might, I, I might have been. I may. I think I'm a little bit wrong. I believe towards the end I was paying seventeen dollars a kilo. That's what I. That's what it was. Because yeah, I give pay for a thousand kilos and he owed me seventeen thousand dollars. That's what it was. What was the story when your plane caught fire with a thousand kilos in it? Yes, I was. Uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd loaded up way down in Mexico, and I was. Uh, I had a sp- place over in in Baja. There's, that's a peninsula there south of San Diego. It goes down a thousand miles, and at that time there was not not much roads, and I found a, a beautiful runway right in the middle of it. It was more than twenty miles to the nearest road. And oh, it had mesquites and trees all over it. And they used to haul meat out of there a long time ago. And the guy named Juan had a had a goat ranch. So I would land there if I, I didn't care where I come from, Guatemala or Oaxaca or wherever I came from, I would come north. And I would go into across the Sea of Cortez and land on that runway and and uh, it wasn't a runway, just a strip. But it's nice and long. And uh my the owner of one would come up in on a mule and we'd unload the airplane, put it up, put the stuff on the bales under the under the trees, and I'd fly into the little town of Mulahay. And I'd take a shower and get a room and have lunch. And then late in the afternoon I would I'd fly back out there and uh and load up and, and go from there northwest out over the Pacific and go way around San Diego, at least three hundred miles off, so that they that didn't see me. Well on this one morning I'm coming up and I'm over Los Mochis at two miles high. I'm 11,000 feet. And I felt a little bump in my feet. And I looked around and I saw oil coming out of the cowling of the left engine. And I, uh, oh, what in the world? Then all of a sudden that, that oil caught fire. And uh, what well, it was a, a cylinder, one of those uh, looked like motorcycle cylinders out sticking. It split wide open. And now the fuel is coming out of that and caught, catch the oil of the engine on fire. And it just burnt that wing. I mean, it was blazing. That thing was hot and it was on fire. <clears throat> well, I thought I was going to die. I really did. So uh, I opened the cow flaps, which lets a lot of air through to the engine. And I put that baby in a dive. And I went almost straight down. I know the wings have come off and the, uh, the tails, those split tails on that, they have been known to come off. And so I, I went on, I think we had 400 miles an hour, never speed. He just pegged that, and I just went right on through it. And I did blow the fire out. <clears throat> so uh, the fire went out, but then I was going too fast to even the controls to have any effect. They were just like frozen at that speed so fast. So anyhow, I, I knew if I pulled out hard, the wings would come off at that speed. So I gradually, gradually, gradually got it out of the uh, out of the dive, and I was at about fifteen hundred feet on one engine, and then I went on above Guaymas, and uh, <clears throat> I thought I would uh, I would I would I have a float plane rating. I used to fly float planes, so I uh, I was ready to put it on the water, and right when it went to touch down, it, there's a cushion of air called ground effect, and it's that thing started flying, and one wing tip would just skim in the water. And I'm holding it up like that, and it's shaking like it got palsy. It's just it's uh, the yoke shaking because it's in a stalled position. And the horn's blowing. Well, I rode that thing all the way to the United States. I got to see a Cortez, probably about another four or five hundred miles. And by that time, it's burned off enough fuel. It will fly a little bit, but not not nothing. I'm keeping it right down on it. And I follow the Colorado River all the way back in into the United States, up about Yuma, <laughs> and, and come on in. See, when in the 70s as well, Roger, did you go to Pakistan and ship three and a half thousand tons of hash? Oh, no, three and a half thousand kilos of hash. Like, how did you end up involved with people in Pakistan? Oh, the guy that I told you about uh, bought that airplane for me, they loved hashish. So there was one fellow that had, had a connection. Boy, he had a big connection. I went over there and the big connection was a taxi driver named Diesel, aptly named. 
<laughs> anyway, he got us a load. I didn't. I didn't care for Pakistan. I got out of there and I came back to. Was going to bring it back to uh, British Columbia, go all the way around the world. So I bought a, uh, a an eighty five foot shrimper that was almost brand new. The guy took it out and got financial tr- trouble in the bank of Mobile. And I paid the back debts and, and and got it free. And man, I took a took a a course in celestial navigation. So those little eight tracks you put them in and you learn how to navigate with a sextant. Anyhow. We went to Pakistan and uh, and and got to hashish and uh, both you get twice that much, but the loaders didn't pay their share and they shot machine gun bullets over the boats getting loaded <laughs> and, and scared us away and it was just them they didn't pay their share so oh, the police came after the first load <laughs> so anyway it came back through the uh, by Singapore and right on up around under Japan and came across the Pacific and unloaded there in uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island Canada. And then I bought a, a float plane. I'd already bought it, and a Cessna 206 on floats. And I flew it down one load at a time, about six, seven hundred pounds, into uh, Lake Osete in the right northwest Washington. Oh, that was some snotty nose flying. It was always just right down on it. And I'd come over uh, a little radio station and just pull the power, and I'd land on that lake. I couldn't even find the boat that was waiting on me, and they couldn't find me in that fog and stuff. We had to talk on the radio, and I had to keep my lights on. Well, see, when you're doing that, Roger, were you obviously the money's the main objective, but was it a buzz for you, like being involved in gun fights and planes going on fire? Like you seem to be a thrill, a thrill seeker as well. Like was it a buzz, like doing what you were doing? You know, I didn't even think of it. Once it was over, the fire's out. You just like, whoo, got away with that one, you know. So I, I didn't. <laughs> you seem to get away now, with so much, so that. Like, see when I did, did you start, now did the, uh, the when I got shot up on that sand strip that that bothered me. I didn't realize how much it bothered me. But even a year or two later, I'd run over a rock in the road and it hit real loud under my hair would kind of stand up on the back of my. Head. Yeah. You got something there that's remembered. Yeah. Did you start growing your own crops as well, Roger? Because did you not get did you not get busted with your own crops of marijuana, two hundred and forty five kilos, I think, or two hundred and forty five tons? Two hundred and forty five tons is what they estimated. <clears throat> I call that my pot plantation. Did you start growing your own stuff? Yes, I uh, I hauled a load out of Oaxaca in a DC three. And it was full of seeds. We shook, we shook several hundred pounds, two hundred pounds of seed out of great big black marijuana seeds. And I thought, now those things are just too. We shouldn't just throw those away. So I give them to my friend in Georgia, and there's old moonshiners that I knew and had worked with, and they had a, a 245 acre field way back in the woods, and uh, it was round, just like the, the circular for the for the for the uh, irrigation, and uh, they planted the corn. And then on every other row, we we went with us to plant those seeds. I guess every one of those seeds come up. I don't I don't believe one of them missed it. Every three feet there was a there was a marijuana plant. <clears throat> well, we knew we couldn't get labor, so I went to Mexico and I got seven Indian people. I mean, native with the long black hair, and they were from way down in Oaxaca. And they came and and uh, I put them out on that farm. There's an old house there, and they stayed there and worked really really wonderful. They never left. And uh, they hold out the males, and they, they put, anyhow, they, they looked after it. <clears throat> well, we started harvesting. We had a billion-dollar crop. And uh, they was harvested. We put some of it in the road and on cotton sheets and stuff to sort of to dry. There's no place we, no way in the world that we have enough uh, shelter to uh, dry that stuff. They had to put it in the sun, which was not the best way. But anyway, my uh, sister had named married a guy named Pete, and it and he went around the chain and ran around the fence, and him and his ex wife found a bale of that marijuana, and they put it on their motorcycle, and was gone. Well, the owner of the land saw in the little mud. They saw he took pictures of it. He saw the motorcycle tracks. He saw the woman's long barefoot. By by dark, I knew who had stolen it. The, the marijuana. Anyway, 
he went ballistic. He wanted me to pay him out. And I said, no, I'll send those people to Mexico with men so they can't talk. No, no, no. Get it out of here. Get it out of here. So uh, uh, we had two hay balers baling hay at night. We had it stored up at my farm right next to Jimmy Carter's and some of it. Some of it in different counties. We had that stuff stored all over. <clears throat> well, anyway, I took my Indians <clears throat> and I left. I said, I don't nothing to do with it. Y'all going to get caught. You Somebody's going to get killed. You're walking around here with a gun in your hand. I just like, this is, you got a billion dollar crop, but if you can't handle it, you can't handle it. I'm, I'm, I'm like, nothing I can do. It's not my land. So anyway, I left and they went to town and they got uh, about a dozen young fellas from the poor section of town in Albany, Georgia. And of course, it lasted three days and they got busted and uh, they got uh, five years apiece. And my buddy that I give the stuff to, he got seven years. And, uh, uh, but I, I, that didn't, they kept on it. They have a, a big radio show across the nation and it was Paul Harvey, Paul Harvey in the news, Paul Harvey and the rest of the story. He'd always tell you, tell you tomorrow. Anyhow, he had that thing on, I, that stayed on for a year or two. And he said, they looking for the big rooster in California, <laughs> but none of them had ever seen me all that help. I, I left before that. So I squeaked away from that. I got Where on a sailboat. It? Yeah, you got on a sailboat, you disappear. And we, we went to Mexico, my wife, and we we just lived down there for a couple of years. We had a great time. <laughs> that was Mexico the first time you went to prison, Roger? No, that was all before. Yeah. So me, when was the first time you went to prison for drugs? Yeah, I went to, they, uh, they charged me with what they call a continuing criminal enterprise. That uh, I was number 41 in the United States. It's called an 848, Title 21, 848, Continuing Criminal Enterprise. It can carry up to life without parole. And John Gotti, I was number 41 in the United States to be charged with it. And John Gotti was number 42. I paid millions and, and gave up my property and made a deal. And I got 35 years for the marijuana, 30 years for the marijuana, and five years for the income tax evasion running consecutive. So uh, I'll tell you about that. Title uh, 848. They don't hardly ever use it. It's uh, They couldn't catch me. I thought they had to catch you, but they don't. If all your friends tell on you, it's just like if you nobody sees you kill somebody, but three people said that was him, you're you're finished. So I had 11 friends tell on me. <laughs> I didn't, they didn't talk. They just, well, Roger told me five years ago or seven years ago, and it goes on. And I said, so you have to run three different organizations with five people in each organization to be charged with a continuing criminal enterprise. I said, I've never done that. And they said, well, who worked on your airplane? Who was a mechanic? Who fueled it up? Who loaded it up? Who unloaded it? Who sold it? Who bought it? You got 10 people before you know it that you might not even meet. So that's how they, that's how they convicted me, and I pled guilty. When was it? You got, the, you got prison in Mexico, but they tortured you. Roger, what year was that? Yeah, I got I got I got tortured real bad in Mexico. I uh, I guess it was about 1974. That was after I shot got shot shot down on the end of that runway. The, the laws, and I went back down there to get it, and I sent, sent another plane down with a old man in, and he made a mistake, landed at the wrong place, and had my pony name in his pocket. Well, they they arrested me, and they'd been after me, and uh. So uh, yeah, they they uh, they did a number on me. They, I, in fact, I almost died from it. <clears throat> they uh, first of all, they just put me in a cell. I, I believe I don't know twelve by fifteen feet long. And before the night was over, there was eighteen people standing in the room on me, just filthy. The next day they come and they had a bucket there for your PC. That thing was running over on the floor. And then we came out and they they just swabbed it out with the same thing you do a, a hog that disinfected. Oh, and then they took me in the back and they put me in a little cell. I think it was about five foot square, real high, and it was hot. I mean hot. And I didn't have any clothes. They took my clothes completely away. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, once in a while, they'd open the door and give me a little food and some warm water. And of course, you didn't know day or night how long you'd been in there. And you could hear the sounds of the other ones being tortured. They'd beat on them and slap them, and you hear them crying and begging. So they took me out and wanted me to sign some papers. And I went and signed them. 
and they had a tub of water that looked like. And they took me by my hair, and three of them helped me down. And I took a whiff of that. It had some kind of gas in that water. And it like it tore my head off. I mean, I tore loose. So I found out that you just, you, you act like that right before you have to breathe. Otherwise, you couldn't, you couldn't put up with it. And uh, then they beat me from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head. I was black and blue and yellow and busted lips and nose. And they want me to sign a confession. If you sign a confession, it's over. You go straight to the prison and you're in there for about six years. If you don't sign a confession, you've got time to make all kinds of bribes and things happen. So I knew I wasn't going to sign that confession. And uh, then they, uh, let's see, what did they do? Then they, they took me and they, they had little chains and on your handcuffs and they pull you apart like this and on your feet and they spread me over a barrel and buttered my backside up. And I thought, uh-oh. And they came with hot chili pepper and poked my whole colon full of hot chili pepper. And it burnt the lining off of my intestines. It was terrible. I mean, just terrible. And, uh, it, that, that's the worst you could do. So after that, now I don't know how long it was, a few days later, I was laying on the floor naked. And they brought a dead man in. And he was frozen. Uh, it was a skinny black man. And he was wrapped and looked like a, a mummy with newspaper all around him from head to toe. And they took him and they put him on a meat hook and hooked him onto a boat on the side of the wall. And he just hung there. And it wasn't long before in that heat. I guess it was uh, 50 degrees in that. His eyes started thawing out and it looked like he was crying down that run. And then his private parts started coming loose and looked like he was peeing on the floor. And that formaldehyde puddled up on the floor under him. And what an awful smell of it coming out of his intestines and all of him. And I put my head under the door. And, and breathed. And when I would wake up, I, I would remember it was like I'd see pink flying pigs, animals all color. I say, I know where Walt Disney got his ideas for, for movies. But anyway, I, I went to sleep and, and then I woke up in the infirmary in, in the hospital and a doctor was very concerned about me. He said that, that formaldehyde breathing it that strong could kill you. So they took me back, put me in general population. and My wife came down and paid a, paid a bribe and I got out. How much was a bribe? $17,000. The same amount. She got the guy that owed me the money for the load, and he come and paid somebody. Friends of ours managed it. So he gave him the money, and early in the morning, a, a guard come, and like, I escaped. He took me down the little aisle real close, almost bent over, <laughs> and I went out the back door of the prison into a truck and whisked me away to the airport. What are you thinking then, Roger? Was You're not thinking that... A near-death experience like that, you've had many, but being tortured and having stuff stuck in your ass and like dead bodies in your cell, was that not the, another chance for you to say, right, enough is enough? Or again, was it just straight back to business? No, I, I think that I did quit for a while. I went to New Orleans and I, I uh, started hydroblasting and I cleaned the Russian grain ship. I had a contract with a Russian, with a um, Greek, Greek uh, shipping magnet to, to clean the Russian grain ships that come in. And uh, I, I did that for a year. And that's when I took the movement around the trip around the world to Pakistan. So I had a break in there from the fly. In 1980 as well, Roger, was your, your marijuana shipment not brought down by the Colombian Air Force? Yeah, in 1980 during the World Series baseball game. I was, uh, I went down in, uh, I was I was on a run runway. I went went in first to to see the farts way down, and the guy lied to me about how far it was. It's four hundred miles further in. So uh, the guy named Dan, what a liar! He had told me where it was. I never would have went. So I went on the fart gorillas run us off and said, "Come back in the morning." So we went back to the staging place, four hundred miles north, and the man was nervous, and I was laying in a hammock after some some woman boiled rooster, but not a duck. <laughs> that thing was stringy. Anyhow, I was about to sleep, and then I just looked up a terrible roar, and two fighter jets were going straight up, but after blows ago, <laughs> I rolled out of that hammock and went out. And then they came back, and they just come around. One of them just tore up the runway with uh, those fifty caliber machine guns. I mean, he just tore it up front of the airplane. Well, I just jumped in it and took off. I didn't even warm it up. Well, they were both on both sides, and they got under me, and they shoot that twenty. 20 millimeter cannon, and uh, they were trying to get me to go to Villa Vincencia, the military base. 
<laughs> I just held up the old hippie sign. No, thank you. I said, it's close, just like me and you in their jets on each side. Their, their wing was over mine. And uh, so uh, I, I saw a big pasture. I had uh, these pins that go into struts of a DC-3. Keep it up. It keeps it from falling, falling on the ground. And those uh, metal pins are, are stuck through the, through the strut. Well, and they got a big red flag on them, plastic. Well, those things are blowing in the breeze. So I landed on a pasture. It looked kind of smooth, but that thing was rough. And I bounced and knocked some of the fuel caps off. That thing looked like it was just, the wings just popping out there. And I jumped out and took the, the, the pins out of the struts, and I took off again. So during that time is when the World Series baseball said that American DC-3 believed to be on a drug smuggling run has just been shot down by the Colombian Air Force. But he's up. He's up and away, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so I wasn't shot down at all. But uh, uh, that that was a recording that they have in the, the World Series. So I, I took off and then one jet left and went to town and one stayed with me. And uh, I uh, I kept going and I, I got into a, 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 by the mountain there was a thunderstorm. And I, oh, he was just Bang, 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 and boom, 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 and he, he didn't 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 shoot me to start with, and uh, so then I went in that thunderstorm, and then I came out, and then then he did some damage to me, and so uh, I went back into that thunderstorm and put that plane up on its side, and just spiraled right down until I I came out the bottom of it, and then I went I wanted to go back and get the load. By that time, I, uh, I my adrenaline's up. I felt bulletproof. <laughs> I was going to go back to the. Uh, back to the, uh, what do you call those people, the gorillas, and get my, and put, pick up three tons. It looked like some good stuff, too. So I put it down and looked on a flat place above the Rio Guaviare. And uh, I kept go, going round and round, and the propellers would cut the weeds. They would waste the iron ore. And uh, after four or five times, it looked like a runway. And it felt so smooth, a mile long. And I said, all right, to my co-pilot, Al, I said, we're going to whiff this top this time. So just before it stopped, the, the thing weighs 30 tons, and it, it was on two wheels, and they broke through the crust, and it was in the soup below, and I gave it full power, but it wasn't enough. And it just came and stood right up on its head, stopped with the two engines holding it up, and the tail straight in there. You couldn't have laid, couldn't have laid a, a plum on it and got any straighter up and down. The uh, hatch for a DC-3 is right over the top, so I just undone it and stepped out with my hat satchel. And uh, the co-pilot got out. And then there was a couple of guys in New Sarge, and that, they got out and they, they had to put up hoses together and shimmy down. That thing's high up there. Anyway, that great big fellow that got me there, he just went to crying. He, he towed his own suitcase. <laughs> so we, there's a village about 20 miles away, and uh, we saw a boy and a girl on a little, little couple of little locks, and uh, we asked them to carry our suitcases because they were pretty heavy. And we got to that village and we asked him, is there any police there? No, senor, no police. You know, so anyway, when we got near the village, I paid them off and tell them to go back. I didn't want them telling whoever was in that village about that plane digging up in the jungle. And it was cloud cover all over, so the jets couldn't see where we were. <clears throat> so we got to the village and was getting a Coca-Cola in a little little hut with a thatch roof. And man, we were surrounded by soldiers. I don't know what we were doing there with they had guns. There were no police there. This was a military base. <laughs> so we broke into a military base. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, we got supper. And, uh, I noticed that there was one big dugout canoe. I guess it was 40 feet long and 10 feet wide. I mean, it was huge. That thing was the biggest log I'd ever seen. And it had a long motor hooked to it, like a Yamaha. And we found out where the man lived. Anyway, they put us in a house, and we slept on the floor. They put a guard at the door. But that big big guy, Dan, that had uh, hooked me up with the load, I got on his shoulders and removed the tiles, one at a time, very silently. And before daylight, we crawled out and got on the ground. And I went to the man's house that had the, had the boat. And I, we told him that we were botanists that was broke down down the river. So I got that man, and he started down the river. After a while, he pulled up on the sandbar and said, I can't go any further. I'm the mailman for this village. I have all the stuff. We said, you have to, mister. I mean, we, we can't go back now. So 
I guess without without gun or anything, I, I gave it my number a thousand dollars, and he was pretty happy with it. But he didn't he didn't want to go any. We had to run the rapids. Anyhow, we got away and uh, come to a village, a terrible poor, and uh, I, I walked about fifty miles to a sawmill and got a got a jeep to come back, and uh, then was all night long going through one creek and river after another, and I got under that jeep. Jagged it up and winched it across. I was I was as muddy as a hog in the mud. And uh, then just in daylight, the driver says, "Get your passports in order because this is a big roadblock up here." Well, like he said, "Yes, this is FARC territory. We're leaving, and they're they're really sensitive. They'll they're going to search everything." I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I don't speak Spanish that good, but I understand this." So I told the other guys with me, I said. Come, come, man. We can't go through a roadblock. Oh, yes, they only make $200 a month. We can do this and that. And I tried to get the co-pilot, please come with me, Dan. No, I'm going to go with Al. They were exhausted. And, uh, so anyway, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll eat snakes in here for a year. Crawl on my belly to get around it. I'm not walking through a roadblock. Not after what we've done. We done violated the airplane, been shot down, and kidnapped a riverboat, man. We, <laughs> we don't need to be going talking to the police. So anyway, they went on through and they spent five years in prison there for those same acts. And I spent 11 days <clears throat> in the jungle going around it. I went with dugout boats, swam across places uh, with whatever way I could get. And I kept asking the Indians, Dantia style avions, where are airplanes? Loma Linda, Loma Linda, where is it? The spar. So I, I went, I, I guess, two or 300 miles. And uh, I remember one day I was in a dugout canoe and I was just telling my wife, Mari, I'm all right. Mari, I'm okay. And she said she was in the shower and she heard me clear say that. And uh, so she was relieved just from the spiritual connection that we had. <clears throat> so I came to a place called Loma Linda. And it was, uh, it looked like World War II Hawaii. It was really nice. Hip flat boards on buildings with tile, and a long runway out of clay and a bunch of airplanes, a hangar. I thought, what is this place? So I went in and uh, talked to the girl. She said, how did you get here? And I said, what is this place? You don't know. This is Loma Linda, headquarters for Missionary Aviation Fellowship for the Amazon. So God tapped me on the shoulder. So they flew me out the next day. <laughs> See, when you, when you were, did you ever smoke yourself, Roger? Did you ever test the product before you took it away? No, I don't, I don't use drugs. Well, I, I have tried them all, but I don't. I don't use them. I, I, I just don't like them. I don't. I don't care for it. And I just don't use drugs. You certainly, I've tried. I'm not like somebody else. I did in hell. <laughs> so in the the early 1980s, like you've done the marijuana, you've 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 distributed thousands of tons, like. But in the early 1980s, you went to Colombia to source a new um, supplier. Is that correct? But you ended up with involvement with the Black Widow. What was that story? Oh boy. Well, uh, I got ripped off for $65,000, which wasn't no big deal. So I went down there looking for it. And uh, so the fellow said, Oh, I give it to the man. And they said, But let me introduce you to somebody. I'm going to introduce you. We're going to fly to Medellin, Colombia. I was in Bogota. You're going to meet my very good friend, Fernando Correo. That he's the biggest cocaine dealer in South America. And he probably was at that time. So we went and Flew to Medellin and went to the, uh, the nice apartment building right downtown, and it was so beautiful. That 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 place is emerald green, and it was just all glass on blue, like twenty floors up. And he was there, and he was drunk. And he was like a Winston Churchill. I mean, he was brilliant, but he was he was just drunk, and he could speak about any language you wanted and talk about anything you wanted to talk about. And uh, so while we were talking. He said, yes, I got plenty of work. I'll pay $5,000 a kilo. we we'll go talk to Marta. That was his wife. She lived over at the country club place, and uh, I did. But while we were talking, this lawyer that had taken me across there to the place, in walked a uh, kind of an Indian-looking woman from Bolivia. She had dressed in rubber, rabbit fur jacket and skirt and boots. <laughs> it looked kind of like a clown, but she's kind of pretty and all painted up. And... uh so this Fernando asked her where she was going. She was going to Miami to buy an airplane. And so he was in. So the the, uh, the lawyer was a lot quicker than I was. He said, well, Roger over here's got an airplane for sale. <clears throat> and uh, he winked at me. 
So she turned to me at first time, like she's noticed in me. She, I'm just a lowly person in the room. And what kind of airplane do you have? I said, I have a Queen Air. Oh, Queen Air. Now she's, she likes the idea of Queen Air. She thinks she's the Queen. <laughs> I said, yes. And uh, what did it haul? How far will it go? So I told her it was tanked. And she said, okay, you bring it down. I like it. I buy it. I said, well, that's a long way for it to come. You give me $5,000 and it'll go towards the price. Said, what is the price? And the lawyer's doing his thumb up, 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 up. <laughs> so I raised the price. I didn't think I want to sell the plane. And uh, so uh, uh, she, I said, well, he'll, he can land tonight in, in Panama or tomorrow night. I forget which. So I had a friend of mine to bring it down. And uh, we were waiting on the on the uh, at the airport, and it came in. It looked like a big jet coming in. It was it was nice. Had a big landing light. And uh, so she liked the airplane. She said, "You have to go to Bolivia to get your money." All right. So the next day we loaded up, put her on trudge, and flew to Santa Cruz, Bolivia. And then we met by the police, and they had a she had a limousine with the little flags on it, and she's the black widow. I mean, she's the cocaine gal of Bolivia at that time. And we went went through town and went out and edge of town under a big uh, uh, water tank, Santa Cruz, where it says, if you're ever looking for her house, it's under the Santa Cruz water tank. And it looked like a, a, a marble mausoleum, just a square place with a big fence all around it, barbed wire all over it. And we had 10 or 12 people out at the gate crying and wringing their hands. They were just all upset. And she got out of the limousine. What's the matter with you fools? He said, your lion is eating the baby. What? She opened the gate and ran in. I went behind her, and she had a mountain lion. I guess that thing was a 200-pound big old male, and he was eating the mage baby. <laughs> he just about threw with it. The head was still there and some of the guts and little clothes, and that dog had the blood all over the floor, and that lion was just had his blood all over his face. And she just ran, grabbed that lion, pulled him away, and went to another room. What a terrible, terrible sight. That's in my life. That's the worst thing I've ever seen. And uh, anyhow, I grabbed my money and got out there. I never even... <laughs> I didn't stay a minute. Yeah, or else you could have been the Lions next dinner. Like, that's mad. Like, like some mad stories. Like, was that when your cocaine journey started, Roger? Yes, that's when, that's when I started there. Is that when you came into contact with Pablo Escobar Um is it Carlos Leder? Who's the guy the Johnny Depp done the film Blow for? Yeah, that, that Carlos Leder. They, yeah, so, they they didn't like Carlos much uh, at all. But um, yes, I um, I went. Uh, I kept waiting for Fernando to sober up so we could do business. I went to see his wife, and she she's a lovely lady. And they've all been killed since then. And their son, too, and his girlfriend, all of them been murdered. Just about most of the people I know down there except one but it did. So uh, <clears throat> she, uh, I was up in Belize, and uh, I, I called, and she said that they're having a birthday party for Fernando on the Pacific Coast, and the airlines are flying people over to their to their state over there and invited me to come. She said, he'll be sober for his birthday. So I flew back down to Medellin, and Surely I got on a, a, a airliner, twin engine, those British shorts, not remember. Them. And they flew load after load after load of people over. And uh, we landed uphill from the ocean. And what a place. I mean, I could have made millions of dollars just on the junk that was on each side of that runway. They were D8 caterpillars with the rusting in the rain and all kinds of different airplanes that they had abandoned theirs because they had used those old numbers to put on new airplanes just so they wouldn't have to pay the duty. Anyway, we stayed there for three weeks, three days, and people came there from all over Columbia. They were movie stars, judges, police chiefs, all kinds of things. And what they were doing, they were trying to figure out how to stop the killing. Let's work together. But I suppose that was uh, right that weekend was somewhat the beginning of the Medellin cartel. Um, let me get that off of the thing. So uh, I uh, I met a fellow there, Jaime Ordonis, and I did a load for him, and it didn't work out. Uh, he didn't, I uh, was supposed to be 300 kilos. He put 165. I gave it to Bill Barbosa in Miami, and somebody shot him in the stomach for it. And I was two or three months getting my money, and uh, I didn't want to work for those. So I told my friend Mario 
no, I'm not going to do that. And he said, well, let me introduce you to somebody. So I flew back down there and, and he took me to a little town in Begada. And we went up a little mountain road and went through a, a turnpike where the guys, where the guards let us in. In a lovely old house and people waiting in the yard with a little stone hitching rails from a house, probably two or three hundred years old. And uh, those rich people that bought them little cold fincas, little, little, little tiny, well, two or three acres, ten, oh, that was bigger, maybe 20 acres. Anyway, uh, we were ushered in to see Jorge Ochoa, a very nice young man. And, uh, and he spoke English and he had a huge desk, and on his desk was 12 telephones. And uh, he said, and he pointed to them, he said, now this is in New York, this is in Chicago, and that's Denver, that's Los Angeles. He said, when I'm run, one rings, I know who I'm talking to. So, uh, and then he uh, asked me about the airplanes I had, and what kind of airplanes I had. <clears throat> I had a turbojet aero commander, and I had a Beach 18, I had a DC-3, and so he was, how many loads you done? I said, I've done over 100 loads across the border, never been caught. So he was he was happy with that. So he sent uh, the the pretty woman that was uh, that made his coffee next door, and uh, Pablo Escobar came in. She introduced us. He had, shook hands. Took them. he said the same thing. We got all you can do, all the work you can do. Five thousand dollars a kilo. Be glad to have you on board. He went on back to his office. So he was in a plaid shirt. A guy about my size, five foot eight, hundred and sixty pounds. So he seemed nice enough. He didn't. Didn't have fangs or horns at that time, but I understand later on he was a terrible monster. But what was he? What was um, how many kilos did you used to ship for them at a time for Pablo Escobar? <clears throat> okay, I, I did three hundred kilos at the time, and uh, I did uh, I don't know how many loads I did, but I did several loads, and I got above the clouds one night, the fog, and I couldn't get down. So I had to come down to Glide Slope at uh, New Orleans with a closed runway and sit there all night. And then I, the next morning it was sunshiny and, and I still couldn't go. And uh, it, it, I thought, I'm definitely going to get caught this time. But I got up and went across from my place and I had to put it in a dive to go through the fog get on a little short strip out the woods. And so I told the Colombians, I'm hanging it up, boys. I ain't never going to do this no more. And uh, the guys in uh, Lito, the guy in Florida, Oh, Roger, no, because they was making money off of me. They was they get the money to, to distribute it. So uh, don't you know anybody, anybody? Not that, uh, mostly to do them a favor, just almost begging me to find somebody. Fly if you won't fly. So I hired Barry Seal. And Barry was like, oh, man, that was all right. He, never, he didn't believe it. So, uh, and, and then I did fly some. I flew the bottom end, and, uh, and I'd, I'd land in Belize. And we'd switch off the planes and release them. Then I got, uh, I hooked up uh, Pablo Escobar and Ochoa told me about landing in Nicaragua with, with the military there. And that way we could refuel and come all the way on in. And Barry was, uh, <clears throat> had the governor fade off there in uh, uh, Mena, Arkansas. And uh, I had to pay $50,000 every time he landed for protection. Of course, he had, you know, who he had. And he had the CIA, uh, CIA there unloading him. They was all working together. I didn't know that. When I went to prison, uh, he paid for my airplanes and uh, and continued to work with the with the authorities of the, the CIA. Did Pablo Escobar build runways for your specific operation with him? One time I went and told him the runway was too short. We already couldn't get off of that load. The next time I went down there, it was 5,000 feet long, if that's what you're talking about. I mean, they made it, they had bulldozers and motor graders in there and it was it was fixed up fine and but then the biggest thing that he did was hook us up with the sandinista government in nicaragua so we could refuel at, at uh, a regular strip go and get something to eat and watch your airplane and send you on your way stay long you wanted to where did you pick up the cocaine from colombia and take it to america yes picked it up in colombia and took it to uh i took it up there to louisiana but Barry took it up to uh, to Mena, Arkansas. And that movie that Tom Cruise played should have been called Mena. But when Hillary was running for presidency, the Democrats put so much pressure on them until they stopped the production because it's implemented with Clintons. And uh, they um, they changed the name of it to America Made. So, if somebody Google that if they want to. Barry Seals in the Mena, Arkansas connection. 
How did you end up in contact with Barry Seal, who's known as one of the biggest snitches of all time? Like he brought down cartels. He, he brought down yourself. Like he was your friend. You always still speak highly of him, Roger. But how did you end up meeting in the first place? Okay, I was looking for a place to uh, to live about halfway between Colombia and, and the United States, and I looked at Honduras. I like Honduras. It's an agricultural place, and I was raised on the farm. I thought, all right, I'll do that. So I took my wife and the children. We went down <clears throat> to uh, to Honduras, and we went up in the mountains. And I looked at a ranch, and that thing was lovely, but my wife just didn't want to move there. That's the, the grass was waist deep, and the cows were fat, and the river running through it with fish. Swift and oh, so nice. So we came to San Pedro Sula and had to get on the airplane and all our clothes were muddy. We took them to a a, a laundry. And they said we have them ready, uh, you know, tomorrow, but they weren't. Come back in the morning. Well, we already had tickets to go to New Orleans. I, maybe we lived in New Orleans, and I don't remember. But anyway, the clothes weren't ready. I told Mari to take the children and y'all get on the plane anyway. We got tickets. These planes are full. It's easier for one to get out. Uh, on standby than it is for four of us. So she did. And I went to the laundry and got the clothes. And I mean, there was a pile of them. I had them on my back. I got an old taxi and I paid him a hundred dollars. Just please go fast. And he just blew the horn faster. And I got to the airport. The plane was taxiing out on the tarmac. And I ran around. And I waved to the pilot. He nice looking fellow. He waves back. <laughs> and then I saw Mari's face in the, in the cockpit. Brand new airplane. And the front wheel went down where he put on the brakes. Then he put the ladder out for me. And he put it almost out. And then he pulled it up and took off again like a like a guy waiting, stopping for a hitchhiker and then taking off. Anyway, he went a few feet and he stopped. And everybody was laughing. I got on with my clothes. And everybody just gave me a clap. I mean, it was a full on that I made it. So I went on back. And my daughter, Miriam, I guess she about nine years old at the time. <clears throat> she was sitting in the middle seat. And Barry was sitting by the window. And I sat down and I thought, oh boy, he looked like he could be, <laughs> he could be trouble. He looked like he might be the CIA or the DEA. I ain't gonna fool with him. He had nice blue eyes. He kind of had a princely look. So uh, uh, we didn't speak. And I said, well, it's, it's not, it's not assigned seating. So it's just random that we're together here. So the wheels came up under the 727 with a thud. Then he got on another couple of minutes. He got up five or 10,000 feet and a little click. And you could feel it through the airplane. And Miriam said, what was that, Dad? I said, he just turned on his autopilot. And the fellow researcher said, you fly these things? I said, I got a few hours, mister. He said, my name Barry Seal. How you doing? And uh, so uh, we got to talking. He said he just got out of jail that morning. He'd been, been a year down in Honduras. And uh, I didn't believe him bit the world. But when we landed, there was a whole mob to meet him. There was grandma and mama, wife, husband, wife and children. They was hanging on him and crying and hugging him. I, that guy telling the truth. He just got out of jail. So I wrote my address on a little piece of paper. And I said, uh, come out to Santa Barbara, California. I may have some work for you, Barry. Be interested. And uh, so a few days later, he showed up. And I took him up flying. I had a almost brand new uh Aero Commander Turbo Prop uh, 690B. That thing was hot. <clears throat> so I said, show me what you got. Well, I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> he had more than I wanted to sleep. That guy was an aerobatic pilot. He's like those blue angels. I mean, he could fly. I can fly from one place to the other, but I had no air show, man. Anyhow, he he cut the engine and flew it sideways like this called the falling leaf and, and rolled and looped and Emerlins and everything else you could think of, just one right after the other. That's enough, Barry. I had me throwing up. So anyway, that's how I met Barry Seal. So I said, this plane needs tanking. He said, I got a mechanic in Mena, Arkansas that'll do it for ten thousand dollars, and he will never say a word. So I know now that he had his uh, CIA guy mechanic there working. So they he, he went away with my airplane, and I flew to his house. Uh, some days later, he called, and I flew to his house in Baton Rouge, and we made a deal, and so he flew for me for over a year. When did you find out he was working with the CIA, Roger? Of course, he was working with the CIA. So. Yeah how how long did it take you to find out though that he was working with the CIA? Oh, after the fact, he never told me he had the CIA. 
He told me he was taking his fifty thousand dollars. We're going to go to have dinner with the governor. So that was Bill Clinton. I, you know. So he said, I got it paid off to the top. It's impossible for me to get caught in Arkansas. It's impossible for me to get caught in Mena, Arkansas. I said, well, it's impossible for me to be caught in Columbia or Nicaragua. I guess we got a, a permit. So he flew, I believe it was 30 trips for me and, and had no problem whatsoever. Then I went to prison for the uh, for the marijuana. I got 35 years, I think I told you. And yeah. uh, Was that in Miami? I got arrested in Miami, but they brought me out here to California. And uh, the charge was out of Los Angeles. What you thinking then, Roger, when he's your friend, you've brought him in to make some money, and then he's turned against you and everyone else? That were you were you disappointed, heartbroken, or was it was it expected? Uh, by that time, I'd had everybody in the book. To, it, it, they weren't nobody. Everybody I knew told them they weren't one person that stood up solid. I mean, when they facing life, or they facing that many years. And Roger can go in my place. They'll 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 feed you to it right quick. So no no doubt in my mind that that's the way the that's the way the government makes makes them do it. So what happened with Barry? Uh, he didn't want to tell. I mean, he did not. Well, I guess none of them didn't want to. But uh, I had heard that he had had turned. What I, well, by the time I got out of prison, <clears throat> so I just gotten out. I did I did about two and a half years on that uh, marijuana charge. And they let me out on parole, 30 years parole. And uh, I'm watching, eating breakfast and watching the television. And there's Ronald Reagan, blue eyes, on national television. He said, we have absolute proof that the communist Sandinista government is in the cocaine running business. And there's the old airplane, Barry's airplane called the Fat Lady, a big old C-120, one with a ramp on the back. And it's on the runway, bellied in. And I thought, oh. Oh, my guts turned to ice water. I'm like, oh, the shit's fixing to hit the fan. So sure enough, it wasn't long before Barry called me. And he said, I hadn't talked to him in over two years. But he did pay Mari for the airplanes. He helped her out every which way he could. He sent lawyers in for me. He, he was he did me right. So he came in and uh, uh, he said, I'll be in this French restaurant here tonight at 9 o'clock. So I went down there at 9 o'clock. And he was sitting at the back, lean back. He gained some weight. And I looked around, and there's men and women all around there, maybe 20 of them. And they was in their 30s, 40s, DEA for sure. <laughs> they had it rolled all over, leather skirts, blue jeans, in that fancy French restaurant. And I walked up and said, Barry, are you wired? And he said, no, I'm not. I said, well, you just talked. I'm not going to say anything. We just talked, and he just talked. He said, Roger, I just couldn't do it. They abandoned me. Had it paid off, they left me as a scapegoat. Everybody, every one of them left me, left me holding the bag. You know, you know the score. And he put his hands up over his eyes like that, and the tears ran between his fingers. He said, I am so sorry. I, I just said, it was three life sentences, or join them. He said, so I, I got out on bail on what he was doing. And he said, I went to uh, went to Washington and saw Edward Meese, a federal attorney general. And I told him they're bringing tons of cocaine out of there. And he wouldn't believe me. They run me out of office. I went back the next day and talk, talked him into it. So they put this fellow here, Jake Jacobson, over there in with me and uh says we went down and got one and a half done i built it in it in nicaragua and then we, we brought it on up from another plane and, and you can see the photographs of, of the men unloading it pablo escobar is clear with stripy shirt in the book kings of cocaine and then they flew uh escobar bought another plane they got in that plane after they crashed that one on purpose and they flew it in the homestead air force base and my friend Lito unloaded it and uh, put it in a motor home. Of course, they couldn't let a ton and a half go to the public. So they had uh, DEA with a um, dump truck to ram it. They rammed it in the freeway down there. And that's it. So it, cocaine's all over the highway. So Lito, and he's a highway patrolman, one DEA, dressed up just like a highway patrolman right behind him. Oh, and Lito, send you, I need to call my boss. He said, there's a telephone just over there. Go call him. They want Lito to go. Go ahead and keep this scam going. But there was a guy in a, in a Buick said, that's cocaine. And he tackled Lito right there in the highway. <laughs> Wind up that little scam. So uh, he, uh, so Barry just said, listen, Roger, you are 100% under my umbrella. You can keep your money. They'll give you a passport. You can be up anywhere on earth. You and your family want to live. It's all set up. You just got to 
testify before a grand jury with me against Escobar and Ochoa. And I said, friend, they are going to kill you. I said, bring your head on you over. And the guy said, you can come tomorrow. It was a Jake Jacobson. <clears throat> and uh, we drank some Chavis Regal. And said, you can come tomorrow first class. You and Mari testify before a grand jury. Or I can take you down in chains. And the only place you're going to ever see your family again, as long as you live, is in a federal penitentiary visiting room. It's your choice. I said, I'll sure be there first class. <laughs> so I went to Brazil. And of course, they killed Barry. And that's the end of that story. How like how many people did he send to prison, Barry? I don't know. He uh, he sent the president of uh, Turks and Caicos. I know that's the only person I know that actually went to prison because before they could stand trial, they'd killed him, so he didn't get to testify against anybody. Did you know straight away, Roger, if you'd have testified against anyone in cartels, you would have been dead as well? Well, you know, uh, Barry could have. Uh, got another passport and, and live some other country with his family, and and people are doing that all over. And I, I suppose they they would have tried to track tra- tra- you down, but in a few years, all those people were dead too. <clears throat> but uh, he chose not to, and, and a judge there in Louisiana gave him six months in a halfway house. And the DEA says, Mister Judge, that is a death sentence to him. He can't, he got to have bodyguards. He got to have armor. He's got to have guns. The judge said he should have thought about that before he did the crime. Six months in a halfway house. So every night he goes up to this uh, halfway house and parks his car. And, of course, it was not long before three of them are waiting and they machine gun into death. I was sorry. I, I, tears came in my eyes. I cried when I heard about it. I, I, I like Barry. Uh, he was just put in a terrible position. Even though he was going to, even though he was going to testify against you? Yes, but he gave me a chance. He gave me a chance to testify with him. You know, like I gave him a chance to fly with me. He didn't just behind my back tell on me and and, and mm-hmm. not, without making a deal. So I appreciate that too. Otherwise, yeah. How does that make you feel? Yeah. How does that make you feel, Roger? As well that you brought him in with you and then him getting killed. Does part of you blame yourself? You know, I was just sorry that he got killed. I, I, I was down in Brazil, and when I called the club and he said, he's dead, he's dead, and there was all joy. And I, I had a tear in my eyes. I, I went back and told Mari and Miriam, and, and they cried too, that Barry. But he was close. I mean, he, he'd come spend the night in a hotel room with us where there was no room and put the baby up on his big old belly and give him a bottle. Yum, yum, yum. And just, you know, yeah, that's how close we were. So, yeah, it was uh, almost like having a brother died. He was he was a good pilot. He was a friend of mine, the intelligent man that that was put in a, a terrible mess by the U.S. government. He, he, they didn't keep their word. He, he worked for them, and then they killed him or had him killed. How realistic is the film about him, um, American Made with Tom Cruise? It's a very poor movie. Uh, the uh, that, that, that movie should have been called, it was written as Mina. Nina, Arkansas, the hometown of Bill and Taylor Clinton. And it was about them and the payoffs that he was making through them and the CIA. Well, when Hillary was running for uh, presidency, that's when that movie was supposed to come out. And, and the Democratic Party or somebody got so hard behind the Hollywood producer until they just stopped it for several years. They changed the name to America Made. They, the writers quit. The producer quit. And they just they just turned it around, and I think somebody sat in a rocking chair and read about it and tried to fill in the blank. They didn't get anything right. The whole thing was wrong. They didn't get the they didn't get the feeling. They didn't get the sentiment of it. They missed Barry by a mile. See when so do you then go on the run to Brazil? I went on the run. Yes. Who was looking for you? They said that I was on the ten most morning list on the DEA. For drug smuggling? Yeah. So you were going to get a life sentence? I did get a life sentence. Yeah. 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 But is that when... Yeah. So you ended up in the running Brazil. What did you start doing then? Were you still smuggling or was it trying to keep a low profile? Low profile, but then we moved to... uh, We went from uh, Brazil. We flew to Holland and stayed there for a couple of months. My wife is from Holland. And then we... uh, 
went down to France and we lived there a year and we'd had some things in Canada in storage. And we had those shipped across, and of course they had a bug on them, and we we discovered the bug, and we got out of France and went to Spain, and uh, we went to Mallorca, and I was hooked up with uh, your infamous guy, Dennis Howard March, Mister Nice. Well, Mister Nice was not so nice to me. <laughs> I did some loads for him, and uh, and uh, he turned me in, and uh, instead of paying me, and ouch. So I got uh, I got arrested in Spain and I escaped. I got arrested in Holland. I escaped, and then finally they caught me again in Spain. I jumped out the window, thirty one feet from the window bottom to the top of a car, exploded in the street. But they, they caught me down the road, and, and anyhow they extradited me to Germany. And they handcuffed me with like this, one one hand over the other one, so I can't even get to the handcuff. So I went up to Germany, and they gave me eight years. And after one year, I escaped from that German prison in Lübeck, and. Uh, then I went back to South America and I tried to get some of the money that they owed me. And then I came back to the United States and they arrested me for a parole violation. And they gave me 11 years of maximum security, Long Park Penitentiary for a parole violation that I should have got six months for. All this stuff is about, they dug up that stuff about Barry. They call it a silent beef. So I got 11 years for silent beef. Nothing. They give me through two years for the, Escape in Spain, two years for the escape in Holland, two years for the escape in Germany, two years for this attempted escape from Metropolitan Detention Center. And all. They just stacked all that late years. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it wasn't even illegal in Germany. It, it, did you know it's illegal if you steal their clothes? So you have to wash and iron their clothes and mail them back to them within 24 hours, or don't you get six months? But to escape is not illegal. So you've escaped five times, Roger. When was your first prison escape? Was that in Madrid? I uh, know it was in. Uh, okay, I uh, two times in Mexico. One of them was I paid out the back door. That really wasn't escape, but I, yeah, they they counted as escape. <clears throat> and another time, I kicked the door off of a jail over in Baja and got away. And then I escaped at the, at the uh, Schiphol Airport with the while well, I'm all over me. Then I escaped in Spain at the jumped out the courtroom and 31 feet on top of a car. And then I escaped from the max security prison in, in Lubeck, Germany. And that's not counting just the times I escaped from the police. That was just <laughs> lots of time. How did you escape from the maximum prison? That's, that's, that's a whole story in my book, The uh, the Smuggler. Let's just don't, let's don't forget about that, folks. There it is right there. <laughs> we'll leave a link in the description for people to get that. Yeah, we forget the smuggler. It's on Amazon. It's in audio and video and everything else. But uh, yeah, I uh, it's quite a, quite a long story how I got out of that prison. You want me to tell it? I will. Yes, of course. All right. <clears throat> I was there and uh, they they put me uh, <clears throat> a little job late in the afternoon, twenty minutes to clean the lawyers' visiting area. Well, that was still all in the main prison, but it was behind that big, big door. And uh, so you went in and had the three rooms and they had high windows and they had bars on the windows, but they was made to be pretty, it looked like music notes because it only went out into the prison yard where they kept the uh, the equipment for soccer. Well, they didn't want that in there because you could have put it up. There was a wall around there and every hundred feet was a was a tout with a, was a guy with a machine gun or rifle. That thing was, I mean, it was, it was a bad place. They had Red Brigade, and they had all those guys in there from Turkey and machine gun guys. They, it was it was colorful. So uh, I uh, I was coming back uh, from court, and I saw that they was uh, had taken above the Sally Port, that they'd taken the, 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 uh, all that rolled up razor wire off, and they were putting a new wall up to expand it. And I, oh boy, there's a route out of here. <clears throat> so uh, I, I I got a rope for a jump rope, a good heavy rope. They made a, a rubber boat for the Navy, and they had a the painters got they are kind of heavy. So I got that, and they have heavy mop panels, and I cut the mop panel in two, and I put that down my shirt leg. And whenever pants leg, and whenever I went in there late that afternoon, uh, I wrapped that rope around, tied a bow in. And put put it around and, and tied it like that, and pull those bars together. Then I did it on the other side, 
say that thing come loose and like to knock my knuckles off. <laughs> I thought peed my pants, it hurt so bad. When I quit dancing, I did it again. <laughs> and I, I almost died going through there. It was pouring down rain on the outside, and I had to take my shirt off, and I lost it back in. And the skin just came off all my chest, right down to the blood, and trying to work it to get through. And I got through, and then my pants, my hip was bigger than my head. <laughs> I had to undo my pants, and I fell out on top of my head six feet down. Right on top of my head and right in that rain, I got up, went around the corner there, a little corner there, and there was a scaffolding up four floors. They were changing some windows in that uh, prison. And I had to reach with one hand on the bricks and the other hand on the scaffolding and I, so the guard in the tower couldn't see me. And I got all the way above him on the fourth floor and lay down up there in that blood and rain. And I got to the end of it, and I looked down, and two floors down was a... Uh, uh, the guard tower was sticking out above the Sally Fort, and it's like a uh, the top of it was like a silo halfway, and uh, so the wall was just just out in front of him and below, and beyond that was a big side pile of sand, just like you see. It was huge, I guess, ten feet tall, and uh, a backhoe or something piled it up there where they could uh, do the foundation for a new wall. Well, there was a, a guard and his wife and a little boy, like, like about three or four years old, was coming. It was really raining. And uh, they was under a dumb, double umbrella. I never saw one, but looking from the top of it, it's just like that. with the double. And she took him to the door. And when she went back, and she was right in line with that machine gun, if I could watch, I jumped straight down, one floor down on top of that, that roof of that place. Bam! And they got home. Hey, <laughs> scared. <you. laughs> and I bailed over the fence, and I went up to my knees in that sand on the sideways. It didn't even slow me down. And I ran straight towards a woman and on past her. And then I got to the corner, and I was running downhill. And I heard flam, blam, blam, blowing the horn. And that fool woman was up on the sidewalk trying to kill me. She was knocking down the parking meter, just tearing her car up. And I run behind a car that was parked down there, and she tore the bumper off of her, the fender off of her car. And she had a demon-like face just screaming at me. And that little boy standing in the front page, I thought, well, I can't go no further this way. So I got up on, there was a wall there with a and there was concrete, and it had a little glass on top of it. And I tore my hands and my stomach up worse. I was bleeding so bad from that glass more than I was where I went through. Anyway, I got away and went to Holland. Did Pablo Escobar owe you $3.5 million? That was uh, Jorge Ochoa. And he's still there, and I went to see him. He won't talk to me. I think my friend or the unloader, one of the other, got it. He, they, they told him that they paid me, so he won't pay me. And Howard Marks, did he owe you two million as well? Yeah, he, and he turned me in with that German deal. <laughs> he knew he was going down, and they put yeah. us in together in the same place. Every time I'd see Howard, the police show up, and I'd escape from him three times. See when you were. Um, taking your money to the Cayman Islands, how much were you taking over at a time, Roger? Oh, I put $15 million in the plane, laid on top of it, have a couple of pilots fly down. Did you not have the check of $15 million in your pocket, but you had to eat it? I ate, I went into the bathroom and ate the receipt. I had it in my pocket. I didn't want them to find that. I had a uh -huh. receipt for $15 million, yes. Out of all the prisons you've been in, Roger, what's the worst prison? Of Mexico by far. And then, then they have one up here near Apple Valley that were just awful, too, with federal prisons. they all bad now. These federal prisons are just awful. They got the guards hate you. They hate one another. The blacks hate the whites. The whites hate the blacks. The browns hate both of them. It's just, it's just a place of hate. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you have to walk easy. It wasn't that way when I went in 40 years ago. It was pretty people love one and I got along. And yeah. now they're just like, it's not good. You don't want to go to prison, I can tell you that. Not in the United States. So see, you've been in prisons all around the world, Roger. You've had warrants out from police all around the world. You've shipped thousands and thousands of tons of drugs. Like, what was the... See, when you came out of prison in America, what, were you, what was your plans then? Were you thinking just to go straight, or was it trying to then go on a run again because you ended up in Australia involved in the biggest one of the biggest drug busts of all times with a thousand kilos of coke like, did you have a warrant out when you get caught with that I had a warrant out here for a parole violation 
and I was trying to avoid it. So when I left Germany, I uh, I, I didn't have anything. If, if, as long as I didn't come back to America, I wasn't wanted because on a parole violation, they cannot extradite you. I could have stayed in Bahamas or anywhere, Canada or Mexico. They, they can, if you show up and put your foot on American soil, you're, you can serve that 30 years that I owed. That's what happened. So when I finished that, I went back to Germany and they let me out on the street. And, uh, and then I was, I needed some money. So I, uh, I took that job to take it, the boat to Australia. I was going to make twenty million dollars. So, how did the the job to Australia come about to make twenty million dollars? It ended up one of the biggest drug busts of all time with a thousand kilos of cocaine. Like, how did that come about, Roger? Well, I went down to see Ochoa to see about the three and a half million dollars, and I saw my friend that wanted to introduce me to him. And uh, of course, I wasn't going to get my money from him. He said, "Well, listen, would you like a job? We'll get you pay you twenty million dollars to to buy a boat and." Uh, Take it to Australia. Take a take a load of Australia. To Australia. Sure, I'll do it. That's a lot of money and for three months of work. How did you? How did you? How did you get caught, Roger? Okay, the uh, the the brother, the owner of it, <clears throat> his brother went down to unload it, and he went there way too early. He's Colombian, and he called his friend, I think from California, another Colombian boy, young man. Says, come over here and help me unload this big load. You're a really smart guy. You just got out of a five ton deal in California. Well, when I heard that, I took the boat and turned it from which way I was going. You don't get out of a five ton deal in California without without a, a, a big confession. They call it a, a four slap confession. You know what a four slap confession is? No. You slap him one time to get him started talking. Then you have to slap him three more times to shut him up. <laughs> what you thinking then, Roger? Like, obviously, you've been caught with one of the biggest shipments in Australian history. Like, did you realize then that you were going to go away for life? Yes. I, I have visions. And I, have a, I had about two weeks before I was arrested, I had a vision of being in the ground with the guns and exactly like it happened. I even remember the vision better than I do that it actually happened. And uh, I was saying, poor, poor, poor Mari. Poor, poor, poor Mari. I woke up crying with the tears coming down my face and the guy in my back with the gun. And the, and uh, it happened just exactly like I saw. I, that's when I turned the ship and went 500 miles from where I was supposed to go. And it still happened exactly like I saw it. What are you thinking then, Roger, when you get caught and you're getting life in prison to a woman who's stuck by you through thick and thin, but... This is your biggest sentence. Like, did you know that she would still stick by you, even though you were going away for life? Well, I, I, I didn't worry about it. I mean, uh, we and her are so close until uh, I know she, I just knew how devastated she would be, as devastated as I was. And uh, to start off with, I got, uh, uh, I got a 25 year sentence with a, with a 14 year bottom that I had to do 14 years straight what in life so I'd have, I'd have been a medium security prison out for maybe rehabilitation or something and then um, I testified for a fellow that was on the boat and he went home and he got free so the crown appealed my sentence and they and they I was in the uh, a place it was a terrible place I was in the shoe like the silence of the lambs were looking at me through one-way mirrors and uh and it came in that uh by just by by letter that I my sentence had been raised to life imprisonment. So I tell you what, it was hard to swallow. My knees was weak for a few days, <clears throat> and that's whenever I uh, I decided to write my uh, my memoirs. I said I didn't particularly want to write a book. I just my children, my grandchildren, and great grandchildren are never going to really know me. Let me let me tell them the real happy daddy today is. And so there was a computer in there in a the little room. It's glassed in. And it was just like in the movie, The Silence of the Lambs. I mean, it was just exactly like that. There was a cage and I was in it. But I didn't know how to, I can type, but I didn't know how to turn that computer on. So it, it didn't have a program on it. I got the, got the guard to turn it on. And uh, it had a thing called paintbrush. No, no, uh, no program. So I sat down and I just started typing. I can type pretty good. And, uh, the tears would just run down my face as I'd remember something happened many years ago with, with my loved ones and on the farm and all that. And I wrote over a million words in one line before I quit typing. 
You know, it's like Forrest Gump. I run as far as I wanted to. Now I'm just going to quit. So after a year of that, they let me out in general population. And pretty soon they sent me to a place called Stealth Care. And uh, Australian prisons are, are civilized, let's say. They're not good, but they're civilized. If you behave yourself, you can go to a place called Stealth Care and cook six or 12 people to a, 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 a an apartment, say. And that they bring the food, or you can order it, what you want different different ones. Anyway, I uh, they let me buy a computer, and it took me a year to figure out what I had written. It was all down, but there was no no paragraph or, or nothing. So it, it took and that that was a that was a chore. And then I I, I took two thirds of it away and, and pub and published the last uh, five hundred and thirty pages, I believe. How was it writing it, Roger? Did it bring back a lot of emotion, like reliving everything that you've done? You've been through, like, the, the, the family destruction. Like, was it difficult, or was that therapy for you? It might have been therapy. It wasn't difficult. It just it just flowed. It was just like I, I couldn't write a fiction book for nothing, but I can remember very well. And as it come, I just remember things. Those people dead 70 years sometime. And it just, I'm telling you, it's just wonderful. I could almost smell them, you know? It's when you get something, you like you get a little news on your shoulder, and he's talking to you as fast as you can type, and uh, it just goes. You know, like he didn't want to quit when I had to leave the room. Like I'm not through typing, and what when was it was it? finished, I was yeah. in it. That's it. What was it like getting released, Roger? Like a man who's always you've always been caught or you've always escaped, but you've always get back into business. That. Like, even though you were in your 70s when you got released, like, are you then thinking, fuck it, I'm going to go again, or was enough enough this time? Enough is enough. I I, I wouldn't, well, listen, I wouldn't mind doing it. I think it's just fun. It's romantic. Get an airplane or boat and sail around the world. There's a lot to it. But I just, I wouldn't pay the penalty, and I would not do that to my family again. I don't, I wouldn't even, and, and plus, I don't want to die in prison. And if I do it again, I'm going to die now. There ain't no doubt about it. They'll kick me out in the box and burn me or something. And I just, it just, it would just devastate my poor wife. But, oh, yes, I, uh, no, I, I don't want to do it again. And, and anybody be a fool to do it. I mean, 33 years in a cage over money? I didn't need the money. I don't, I don't need it now. I didn't need it then. Just like, why? It's not greed. I, I, I was so, I give all that money away. Or had it stolen from me. My business partners were thieves. <laughs> I owned a whole city. I owned a real estate outfit. We built, we did. We had oil wells and hydroelectric plants built. I, I had no chance of ever getting that money back from them crooks. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's just not, it don't come back. I had boxes of it. And my wife said it just had wings on it when you give it to them. It just goes away. Oh, yes, we've made millions. We've done this. Then the one guy we did so big with, he just flew into the side of a mountain. Everything was in his name. It's just like, just gone. That old hairy hand of fate turns against you. It turns all over. Tell me this, Roger, that you're 79 now, the life you've lived, but do you miss it? Well, not so much. No, I have, I have enough of it. I, I'm going flying again. I uh, I go fly an old twin beast, and I go in, and I'm flying the simulator out there. I can put a 747 in there with two engines on fire. They can crash and burn. I can start over again in a minute. It's kind of fun, but uh, it's not the same. <laughs> What's the biggest drug deal you, you ever done, Roger? Oh, yes. I did uh, 17 tons out of Thailand. And that, that was the biggest one of Thai, stick, Thai weed. That was expensive. That was $1,400 a pound, so you can figure up how about that was. I can't figure it in my head, but 60 or $70 million, something like that. And, but there were several of us in it, so it wasn't that big for me. How was that when you found out Escobar was dead? Like, if he owed you three and a half million and then you found out he got killed, like, how was that feeling? I, I didn't I didn't care nothing about him one way or the other. It was just like reading some, some famous person died. It didn't bother me a bit. I didn't care. I, I mean, he should have been killed a long time ago to bring an airliner down and, and kill all those people. But a lot of people loved him. I mean, he, he was all right to me, but I didn't. I didn't care. I didn't know him. I didn't. I, I, I went with uh, Escobar one day uh, and spent a day with him. We flew up to uh, some 
branch he bought in his plane. There were several of us in there. And we got off and uh, uh, early in the morning, we went in there and had a little breakfast and tortillas and whatever. And, uh, it was just a plain place. It, I guess I don't know how it come about it, how big it was. But it had burned over and they were stumps and logs. And uh, there were some motorcycles there. And he asked me if I could ride. I sure I could ride. So they put like a Mac 10 machine gun around my shoulder and, and uh, there was the motorcycles lined up and they did that on purpose. And so I got on there as a hot shot and wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't. And I took off through that grass and there was a little ditch about knee deep. <laughs> and the front wheel fell in that thing. And I skidded about 20 feet through that grass on my chin. And they about fell off their motorcycles laughing. They knew it was going to happen. <laughs> so we rode around a while with the motorcycles and we come back and got some horses and got on the horses and pretended to round up some cows and stuff. And that was, that was the only time I've ever spent any social time with him. Did you realize how big he would have been? Obviously, now people still talk about them. There's still books written about and films. And then when you were working with him in the 80s, did you realize how big a name he would have actually been in the drug world? No, and he wouldn't have been if he hadn't been such a mass murderer. We hear about, you know, all these people that kill a lot of people, and, and uh, they seem to get a, a bigger name than the good. But Joe Chowers moved a lot more cocaine than he did. But he got the name for it. They they went in that prison that was, they made for themselves, and they kept their head down and came out after a few years. Well, well, why wouldn't they? The, the wives could come in and stay with them, <laughs> have any kind of food they want to have caretakers and king size beds and air conditioning. Why didn't they just behave themselves and get out of there like the old show was? But no, he wanted to keep keep things running. How big were the Median cartel, Roger? How much money were they making per day, do you know? Not an idea. I, I understand you. I, I certainly wasn't the only one flying. I know that. So I, I met uh, I met one pilot that would burn real bad, and they wanted me to fly him out, and I wouldn't do it. I said, no, man, I, uh, I'd love to, but I don't want you to know me, and I don't want to know you. But he was, he was up in a bed in some house. I didn't know if I'd fly him home with a load. So I'd just be somebody else to tell on me later on. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that everybody you've kind of worked with are either dead or like, got killed like, and you're still here, Roger? Like, was that to do with you and your personality? Like, like being a cool, calm, collective character, even now smiling and talking about it and just enjoying life? Like, is that a lot to do with your personality? The fact, In fact, the fact that you never stuck anybody in either, because it, like you says, everybody became snitches and rats. You're the only one who accepted their destiny and never stuck anybody in. Like, a lot of people in that life either get killed or life in prison, but you never turned against anyone. Is that to do with your personality and the fact that you never done that while you're still alive today? You know, I, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I I don't believe in destiny or nothing. And it, he gives us uh, enough brains. To talk about. We pray for wisdom. And uh, sometimes you just have enough wisdom to see the danger and get out of the way. And uh, like, all right, I just, I, sometimes I can just feel it and, uh, and step, step aside where other ones go right, right, right on and are punished. So I, I, I think it, that's for sure I know it is. I mean, uh, I, I just, just have a sense about it. In fact, when I was in Long Park Penitentiary, it was so strong until I could tell the next person it was going to get killed. There was somebody murdered there every month. And often I'd say, all right, Mike's got, Mike's, Mike's looking to be dead. It's time days to be stabbed to death. Just like you just can see it. I don't know that that kept me from being killed. I didn't, I didn't bother that. The only people who got killed in there was uh, mostly for um, heroin, heroin. And, and they, they, didn't, they didn't pay their debts. No, they got a kill for it, somebody robbing them for it. When did you get released from prison, Roger? Two years ago? Uh, two and a half years ago, yes, I got in April two thousand. And when did when did you get back to America? Okay, I uh, I was down in Australia, and after eighteen years, uh, I I wrote my neighbor Jimmy Carter, and I said, uh, "Ask him, Mr. President, would you write a letter and and, uh, and tell him, ask him to be kind to me, or, or consider me for parole?" And he wrote a letter and said, "If appropriate." I'd appreciate it if you would uh, uh, consider for extradition or release my friend and neighbor, Roger Reeves. 
And so it did help. I know it did. So it had a, Jimmy Carter is a wonderful person. I hope the United States can find somebody, somebody even close to the integrity and the wisdom that man had, has. Mm-hmm. 96. So if he never wrote that letter, you would have still been not able to go back to America because of the warrant that was issued? Well, when uh, they did, they 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 put what put three marshals on me when they and they extradited me back to the United States. And uh, when I got off the plane, they let the plane in. It was a big old huge plane. And I came and I walked off with uh, just had a handcuff, laughing and talking with those Australian guards, uh, marshals. And I was slammed into the wire. Wham! My nose and kicked my feet apart and put leg irons on me. Feet apart, eyes forward, eyes forward. Mexican gal, these border patrol guys, six or seven of them, all oh, they're mean. They put two sets of leg irons on me, two sets of handcuffs, chained me up, marched me about 100 feet away to the marshal's office. I walked in there and the marshal took it all off except for set of handguns. They just put on a show. And uh, they took me to a Metropolitan Detention Center where I'd cut a hole in the wall back in when it was brand new. And uh, so I thought I was going to general population, waiting for a parole here and here on this stuff that was 43 years ago, marijuana. And uh, they put me in isolation. I, why in the world am I isolation? I've been 18 years in open prison and come back here for marijuana 43 years ago for nothing it should be in a camp. Well, I stayed in that place nine months in isolation. And uh, after a, about a week, I kept asking the, every morning, a l- lieutenant come by and they opened the thing, how you doing, Reeves? And I said, get me out of here, man. Put me in population so I can use the telephone, write letters. Can't do it. Sorry. What in the world? So one morning, a little Judas window pulls up, a nice looking man there with a suit and tie. Hello, Reeves. My name is Short. I'm the associate warden here at Metropolitan Detention Center. We saw your National Geographic uh, documentary, and it does me pleasure to keep you in isolation. Click. And I never could get out. I was in that place by myself the whole time. And so uh, I, I got sent to Oklahoma City. Uh, uh, we have a, a terrible, terrible, corrupt organization here called Con Air. They fly in people, I believe, 21 or 22 airplanes. They fly in prisoners back and forth. If you get arrested with two grams of methamphetamine in California, they'll send you to Atlanta for <laughs> for a um, psychiatric evaluation. And you'll stay at that 1,800-bed hotel in, in Oklahoma City maybe three months. And then they move you out and go from one place to another. It's it's ridiculous. You can't even find out who owns it. It's a Canadian company that owns that. <laughs> but it's definitely for our politicians and and the people with the wardens and stuff. Got gotta be. I mean, it's just awful. So that need that just something needs they just rip off. So uh uh there was a, a lady there, really nice, and she says, uh, I said, I'm waiting for a parole here. And she said, Yes. There was a man from Washington here, and he stayed until 3 o'clock. And then he said to tell you he'd be back next year. What? Yes. So she came to see me in a couple of weeks. She said, would you like for me to ask for a parole on the record? And I said, please. I don't even know what it was. And the next day, she came and said, here, and handed me the slot. I got my parole. And I got out, and I came home. Oh, what a, what a relief. So I'd been gone. Uh, I guess I'd been gone from home about 35 years. So I come home and first thing I did, and uh, I uh, I went in and I just showered all that scrub with soap. And Mari had all my clothes in the closet here. And they was ironing. And she'd send everything to the cleaners. And they were so crisp. And I put them on. I felt so good. And I put on some nice pair of shoes. And I took a step. And the soles of the shoes stayed on the floor. They The strings were all rotten. <laughs> So I just sat down at the table and she had prepared a meal for me. I couldn't even eat it. I was so hard. Ah, the, the place mats were the same. The table was the same that I'd 50 years ago that I'd cleaned the claws and polished it. The silverware is the same. The paintings on the wall the same. Still apartment, but the same ones we had 60 years. And, oh, I just couldn't quit crying. 
I just couldn't quit crying in about three days. I couldn't look at pictures or photographs. It just broke my heart to see her at 40, 50, 60, and 70, and I wasn't there. And the children growing up, she raised those children, and uh, they all got educated, and, and they did doing well. Great, outstanding citizens. My daughter is the one that wrote the poem. She's a physician here. She comes by every day or two to look after me and her. She keeps me on the straight and narrow. Her name's Miriam. <laughs> was, that, was that the biggest moment, you think, in your life, everything you've done, like holding everything back, probably the emotions, to then getting home after 30, 40 years, to then just having that breakdown and realizing, fuck, what was it all about? I reckon so. It was just, it was just something you didn't think of. It was just the tears just flowed just from everything I'd look at would just make the tears. That's, I had missed that for all those years. And my wife's a beautiful woman. How in the world, Mari, did you resist the, you know, what did you say to me? And she said, I told him I wasn't available. And she said, even everybody says, why don't you divorce him? He's getting a, a, a doing life. He may never get out. And she said, I just couldn't ever see another man sitting at the head of the table saying the blessing and the children here. I just couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't see it. And so she she waited for me all these years. So she's the queen of the show. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. You don't get much loyalty like that now, Roger. Like, see, tell me this: that like, if your if your wife never waited for you, what do you think you'd be doing now? Well, I don't know. I, I really don't. I can't imagine it. It, uh-huh. uh, it broke my heart. I, uh, I, I I just don't know. Yeah, but the main thing is your outlet. Like, What's the plans for the future going forward for you, brother? Like, what an amazing story. Like, you've served your time. You've you've done what you've done, but you're a very good character. You can see by your energy, your presence, the way you tell a story. Like, it's unbelievable. And I've sat and across and interviewed many people, but yours is up there as one of the best stories I've ever heard. Like, it's madness. Like, it's just people are so intrigued by these stories, and especially your character. Like, we all have a portrait in our mind of the way a criminal or a gangster or a smuggler should look like, but you're just like the grandpa next door. You're just like someone's grandfather who butter wouldn't melt, even though a man who's escaped prison five times, uh, shipped drugs all around the world, been in prisons all around the world, but yet you're still here smiling, healthy. It's mad to see, but what's your plans for the future, brother? Oh, we have different ones. I uh, I kind of have a daydream of buying another sailboat. Mari and I just say. Just go right on down to Mexico and through the Panama and sail around the southern part of Cuba, then maybe on to the Mediterranean. And I like to go down uh, Greece and Israel, uh, on down through the Red Sea and down to Seychelles and <laughs> Madagascar. I, I, I would like to. Now, I'm having a little, uh, Mari's got her heels kind of dug in, says, You must not remember as good as I do. <laughs> we lived on a sailboat before. Uh, how can people get your book as well, Roger? How can people, the UK audience, buy your book, Smuggler? It's, it's on Amazon. Mm-hmm. It's in uh, hard. It's in paperback. It's in uh, ebook, and it's on in audio, all on Amazon. Yeah, amazing. I would t- let tell you that I've signed a contract with Range Media Partners to make a, a series. They're talking about a thirty-part series, uh, thirty episodes into three series. So we'll see how that goes. I'll find out next month. This will be mega. Like, this should be a film. That, like, the people you've worked with, they've made films about them. Like, this is one of the best. Like, people love this sort of stuff, Roger. Like, because you've lived it and tell your story probably daily, it might not seem as big, but people love this sort of story and true crime sells and hopefully you can get the life that you want and everything you've, you've done in your life, you have created it basically. But to live the best years of your life, and think the best years of your life are still ahead. You're still a beautiful thing. Like traveling the world with the women that you love, then fuck all else matters, really. But um, I hope to see this as a film or a, a, the thirty-part series that deserves it. Deserves it. But would you like to finish up on anything, Roger? Not a thing. I just had enjoyed being here with you. It just have been a real pleasure. Yeah, if you're ever in Scotland, brother, let me know and we'll put you up for the night here. Right, I'll come. Yeah, and uh, hopefully I'll be in America soon. So I would love to come and visit you. And um, anything I can ever help with over here, I'm only a phone call away, Roger. Please come to see me. I'm in Santa Barbara, California. Just a couple hours north of Los Angeles. A nice little town, yeah. 
But thanks for coming on today and telling your story, brother. Um, I'll leave all the links in the description for people to get your book. But I wish you all the best for the future. Stay out of trouble, Roger. And God bless you, brother. And God bless you too, abundantly. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.